Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and I hope you're uh, finding your day well so far. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to Dr. Sikiao's Autism Seminar today. Uh, before I start, I have a couple of quick announcements uh, that I'd like to make. So if you, those of you who have cell phones on, could you please uh, so first turn them off? I'll give you guys a moment to uh, turn off your cell phones. While we're getting ready, we also uh, have several other people who have registered and who are just getting in a little late. So I'll hopefully uh, have all you folks turn off your cell phones to start. And then another announcement I'd like to make before we start is if we can have uh, uh, you guys turn off any recording devices, cameras, recorders, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Don't Uh, before I start, I'd also like to uh, make a, a final announcement that our schedule for today, we will have uh, Dr. Sikiao present you with his um, autism reasons and how he uh, treats autism, and we will have a break at around 2.45 uh, for refreshments. We'll come back around 3, 3 o'clock to continue the, his uh, final case study presentation. And after we finish that, we'll have a session for question and answers. So those of you who have uh, questions, if you could please refrain from asking questions until near the end of the uh, lecture. Now, what I'd like to do is now go ahead and uh, introduce my father, Dr. Sikiao. Uh, and it, it actually gives me great honor and pride to stand in front of you today to tell you a little bit about my father and how he started Chinese medicine and, and, and what led him to uh, pursue this field. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience and a lot of you may know my father, but I also wanted to give those who don't know my father a little background of what he's done and what he's achieved uh, in Chinese medicine. So he came from Hong Kong back in the mid 60s to pursue his electrical engineering degree at UC Berkeley. He also uh, made, uh, got his master's degree there as well. Upon completion at UC Berkeley, he worked at IBM for about 10 or 11 years, and he also, during that same time, he started his uh, alarm company, AEC Alarms, back in 1972. Um, along, those, along these 20, 30 years, my, my father has been very active in many areas, whether it was raising a family, whether it was starting his own business, or whether it was pursuing his Chinese medicine dream. In 1998, 1999, my father decided to stop his career in AEC Alarm and then to continue his dream in, in Chinese medicine. Uh, over the last 30 years or so, he's constantly been involved in treating friends and family who have had very difficult health problems uh, to be treated for. Uh, in 1999, he made the leap to stop his AEC Alarm career and to continue and to start his uh, Chinese medicine career in Hong Kong. Since his uh, start in 1999, he's been very successful in treating many difficult cases, including Parkinson's, heart disease, Alzheimer's, a lot of diseases that are very difficult and probably incurable in, in the Western medical field. Um, in the last several years, he's had much success treating young children that were diagnosed with autism. And I think over the last year and a half, my father was, has presented five previous seminars, all sponsored by AEC Alarm, to share his success with the general public. Um, so what you'll hear from him today is his success stories, his case studies, and how he's been able to treat children diagnosed with autism and to lead back a healthy, normal life. Um, in terms of what he's been able to achieve, uh, the stories and the success stories are never ending. Each case that he has um, treated, success continues to, to be achieved with my dad. Uh, a few other things I'd just like to mention in terms of his, his way of contributing back to society. I, I, I know I've talked about how my father went to Hong Kong to continue his, his uh, career and his dream in Chinese medicine. 
not only does he feel the obligation and the need to contribute to society, but he does that also in financial means. When he was uh, in, when, when he's been in Hong Kong treating Chinese medicine or patients with Ch using Chinese medicine, he also donated a million dollars in Hong Kong uh, to the Donghua group of hospitals. So I think you'll, you'll see that my father is not only a person of words, but also a person of action. So without any more delay, I'd like to proudly introduce my father, Dr. Sikiyan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. this thing right here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very happy to see you all here. And today's a nice day, sunny and um, really cheerful. Well, uh, this is going to be a long seminar. It's about three hours talk. And I hope my subject will be interesting enough to keep you out of sleep. I know it's hard, but uh, particularly after you have lunch and everything like that. But I think some of those uh, subjects I'll be discussing will be quite interesting. And uh, I'll be using diagrams and also with some case study with pictures to show you some of the results that I achieved through the past year, seven years research uh, in Chinese medicine. Well, well, today's subject, autism, is the key word. Um, I'm going to talk about the symptoms of autism and then the causes and also the way how to treat them in Western medicine and also of course, my way, the Chinese way, the Chinese medicine way. Um, so in uh, rather detail, I think. And also I try to incorporate the idea, actually the, um, some of the scientific data that uh, I correlate with the brain, uh, with the modern science, uh, so that we can understand the brain further. Although the Chinese medicine has been thousands of years old, but there are a lot of things we can apply today uh, toward the um, uh, modern diseases like autism. Uh, I know it's kind of uh, hard to understand how can we do that, but by the time I finish up with some of those explanations on the theory that I founded, actually I, uh, through my research effort for the past seven years, you probably would have um, to agree to some degree what I found out. And <clears throat> as we all know today, autism is incurable across the world. And that's it make it very challenging for me uh, to uh, take this challenge and hopefully to come up with something that be able to help the people, help the children across the world uh, to regain uh, some kind of uh, normal life. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'm going to talk about the symptoms of autism. Now, uh, this is relatively a uh, 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 new name, actually. It's not new, but actually it's only recently, for the past 10 years or so, that people are getting aware of and more aware of these kind of uh, uh, strange uh, diseases because they're not that obvious, like cancer or diabetes, that kind of simple, uh, uh, you know, you can through diagnosis easily. It's a very complex form of um, uh, problem that occurred in child. And it could start as young as one, eight, one years old, one and a half, two, and it can go as uh, old as even 20, 30 years old. So <clears throat> I'm going to make a little bit elaboration on these symptoms so that uh, the, you, you people can understand it further yourself too, and as a parent, uh, that you can tell whether your child have this problem and be able to treat them as soon as possible. Uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, for the, um, uh, when you have a child, you know, getting up to about three or four years old, I'm sure you would probably notice uh, that, you know, what, they, what do you expect them to perform, like when to start walking, when to start talking, and how they react with the children or play with the children, and things like that. You have certain kind of expectation uh, you know, I'm through your parents' education, or from observing your, your friends, uh, children, things like that. But sometimes you might see a little differently. I want you to see your child have some strange behavior. And uh, you might think, oh, they're still very young, he's still very young, and maybe give it some time, 
and those problems go away. Now, if you try to be a little more detailed and you try to understand further, you probably notice that a lot of symptoms are related to autism and is actually be able to diagnose, you know, with a scientific method today. It can go as young as two years old now that the child can be diagnosed and confirm whether they have autism or not. <clears throat> well, first of all, let me talk about some of those common uh, symptoms that you may observe uh, for those children. Uh, very easily you can see a child without eye contact. When you try to look at him, he avoids your eye contact. He hides away or just look at some other direction, look at the floor, but your eye. So the lack of eye contact, this is one of the very uh, noticeable uh, uh, symptom. The second is they probably will not interact with their peers uh, uh, very often. They like to stay in the corner and play with themselves. Um, just don't bother what's happening around them. So they are very lack of this kind of social interaction, although they are very young, but they have their own social activities with their own uh, 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 age children. So you probably notice that. It happens quite often in some of those child. And then they also have uh, some of those uh, very commonly observed as hyperactivity. And uh, they can run around and they never stop, they never sit down. You talk to him, he just turn and turn and bang doors, sh slam the door shut. And it's, it's never ending type of movement. And um, this is what we call the ADHD. It's called Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And uh, now they will try to attach a name. In fact, in the medical field, in the Western medical field, they try to attach a name to those symptoms, although there's only part of uh, the autism symptoms. And uh, to be specific what the particular uh, symptom is, so try to use that. Or they call it ADD, attention disorder, attention deficit disorder. The lack of attention. You talk to him, he's not paying attention to you. They're running around. So because of that, it makes it very hard for them to learn very hard for them to uh, interact socially with others. So this attention disorder, they also put a name there as ADD. And also because not only have this kind of unnoticeable problem to some people, they also have very remarkable type of deficit or actually disorder of speech. And sometimes they cannot talk right. They cannot have this word pronounced properly. And some to an extent, you know, severe case, they cannot even talk, not even one word. And that's a severe case. And sometimes even they reach, you know, like 15, 17 years of age, and they are not able to say their name properly, you know, accurately, pronounce wise, pronunciation wise. Um, they just cannot answer questions, and they cannot cope with what's happening around them. You ask them a question, they just repeat what you said. And that's what they call echolilliac, it's echo what you said. You ask him, how are you? He will answer, how are you? It's exactly what you say. It's like a parakeet talking. Okay, they call that echolilliac. So try to put a name on all these symptoms. So actually, by the time you add up all these names, different names, and you have autism. And nowadays, they call the change the name to autism spectrum disorder, ASD, they call it, ASD. It covers a wide spectrum of problems. And that makes it very hard for ordinary people like parents that have no children before to be able to pinpoint a problem or even know that the child has this problem. So also another name they call it is called PDD, Pervasive Development Disorder. It's very broad deficiency in developing the uh, skills, the occupational skills or speech skills things like that. So it's a very general deficiency, like a retarded child. So that's the word they use, you know, it's called PDD. Um, so that always linked to difficulty in speech also. In other words, you know, ask him something, he can answer you. Uh, he can even express himself. They cannot say what he want. Um, very often, they cannot answer how, why, where, these kind of questions. So in other words, in, in the cognitive development, they have some problem. So they, know, they don't understand what you're talking about. So if they don't understand what you're talking about, how can they answer your questions? 
So that's what come out to be um, that kind of development, overall development disorder. Uh, it's very generally, you know, considered that kind of, you know, uh, deficiency is pretty much common in autistic children. And besides this kind of broad name, there's another name it's called Asperger syndrome. Asperger syndrome is a much higher level uh, 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 children that they can talk, they can express to some extent. Um, by just talking to them, you probably do not notice that they have a problem because they can talk like a normal person. But however, they have strange behavior. They may not be able to work with their uh, friends or be able to communicate or interact with them socially. Um, it, very often they try to be a loner, doing themselves in the corner, doing work themselves in the corner. Um, just don't bother to, to, to uh, cultivate any relationship with their peers. So this is, is generally called Asperger's syndrome. It's a high level, you know, a little more skillful than ordinary autistic children. And there are many other little things that uh, you can observe whether they have this problem or not. For example, those children are uh, they like to uh, go around in circles. They turn around and go around and just that kind of movement repetitively, repetitively without stop. And of course, that's considered also as a hyperactivity as well. <coughs> and they also like to repeat words after you, like I said, the echolalia type of thing. Um, they also talk about the same thing over and over again, or doing things over and over again, the same kind of thing repetitively. And you look at him for hours, he may sit there doing one thing. You know, finish it and do it again and over again, that kind of thing. So uh, that is also a um, symptom of this uh, disease. Um, and very often these children have problems with uh, sleeping problem, insomnia. Um, they cannot go to sleep until very late at night, or actually wake up very easily and cannot go back to sleep. And very often they also have constipation problem. Constipation that lasts for four, four or five days, you know, for, for days they have no, no uh, bowel movement. And when they come out, it will be very hard, like a little stone, and that sort of thing is very common too. Um, and also uh, there are some f strange behavior like walking on toes. They don't walk on heel, they walk on toes. So that's kind of funny, but that also part of the symptom of those children. And in fact, I found out why they walk on toe. Uh, one time, uh, my, one of my patients had this problem. And after he got cured of this problem, he told me that if he walk on heel, he would feel a lot of pain. So he tried to avoid that pain. So he just walked on the toe. So this is the reason. So I'm very fortunate that during the past seven years treatment with autism, I have gained a lot of data from those children because they're able to recover. And some of them are considered pretty much healed, or cured even, and not coming back with any problem. And so those people, those children that are cured, at least to a certain degree, like 80, 90 percent, are able to tell me what they suffered in the past, which is not understood by most on every of the Western um, uh, medicine at this point. So from that, I gathered a lot of valuable data that I want to share with people. In fact, I'd like to be able to tell the world that that's what they see, that's what they hear. It's not what you think there, what no people see. See, it's very scary, but that's what happened. I'll talk about that later on in more detail. Um, <coughs> And also, the, um, uh, the, most of those children will suffer some kind of skin diseases, like allergy problem, rashes, eczema, um, this kind of you know, skin disorders, infections very easily. Um, and uh, also, some of those, mo I would say most of the children that are treated have a problem of a small structure, a very small, small bone structures. The hands are very small. Um, you know, the overall body is underweight and, um, you know, less than normal size of a normal development child with de normal development uh, children. So this is also very um, uh, easy to be observed. Um, also, sometimes they have the respiratory, uh, resp uh, respiratory type of problem like asthma, allergy problem, and normal, uh, they, they normally are very allergic to all kind, a lot of kind of foods, 
you know, a lot of different kind of foods. Very easily to get into problem. And sometimes, and start their young. Uh, when they're young, they can have asthma, and which is related to allergy uh, very closely. When people have severe allergy problem, they will very easily actually go into, develop into asthma problem. Okay, this all, so that is a very common uh, problem uh, for those children. Um, and then also they uh, do not responsive to questions. They do not respond to what's happening around them. They have very low uh, awareness, alertness, what's happening around them uh, of, uh, when they have group, during a group of people or even at home. They just don't know what's happening around them. They don't care what's happening around them. So things like that is also uh, very um, uh, noticeable if you try to pay your attention to them. <coughs> Okay, so now there's one more thing I found very interesting that is not mentioned to anywhere in the website or other articles or medical journal reports. Uh, because I'm able to have those children improve to such a point that they have full recovery on the vision and hearing. So I found out most of the children do not see things the way we see them in the, in the uh, area of brightness, sharpness, the full picture of image, whether they are inverted or actually totally distorted. Okay, they actually, uh, I have one twin, uh, a pair of twins that have been with me for almost five years, since about the age of four and a half. Um, they're a very serious patient. In fact, uh, one of those paper that I hand out today have those twins in there. And after they got uh, treated for about three, three years or so, one day uh, they tell me, I see your full face now. I said, what do you mean? He said, in the past, he's half my face. He see me face without nose, without chin sometimes. It's all changing all the time. So in other words, there's a blank spot somewhere in the vision that they don't see the whole picture. That's why some people, sometimes they don't look at you. They don't want to look at ugly face. They don't look at, you know, incomplete face. So that could be one of the reasons why people don't like to make eye contact with people. And then uh, after they get you know, cured to a certain degree and they are able to look at and see the full picture now. And also things are much brighter. Uh, much brighter uh, means you know, actually seeing color again. And one, one, one uh, autistic child which is seven years old when he see me, he have never seen color before. How do I know that? Even the parents don't know. No one knows until I start treating him for about three months. And then one day he said, Dr. Al, I suddenly see more color, things different now. Before I see gray all the time, it's different kind of gray. It's not color like now. Today I see different form of red and yellow, it's all distinctive. So I suddenly found out that child has never seen color. He never know what's normal because he never know what color means until that day he suddenly see color again. You see, that's why it's so hard for the doctor to understand what their problem. Now, and yet the parents said they have taken them to the specialty, like the ENT specialist, to check on the hearing, check on the vision. They all said they're normal. But what they don't know is what kind of, op what kind of image is forming in his mind after go through the processor. You see, and they are not able to express it. Now, most of the time, these children are very difficult to express themselves. So with that kind of handicap in expression, they're not able to tell you what's happening around them. So those people normally do not see very much of the, you know, his environment is very close distance, they can see. And if it's a little dark in the room, they cannot see them. So they are that sensitive to light. Okay, that one thing I found out, they have that kind of uh, deficiency also. Now, come to hearing. Hearing is one thing that is very important. Why? In all the websites, you see that those people are not responsive. You call his name, he's not responding to you. Actually, it's very simple. They don't hear you. So you assume he hears you, but actually he's not. He may be hear some noise. He may be seeing something, not his name, you see. Now, to listen something, first go through your eardrum, and then being processed, and go to your brain, and then you know what's, what kind of sound that you're hearing. But if that processor somehow goes through the brain through a garbage, you know, it becomes like an encrypted type of signal. It's no longer be analog signal like we hear every day. So he would not recognize that sound. So he would not be able to respond to that sound. 
So when you call him, he's not able to know that you're calling him. And that's why he's not responsive. And that's simple. But because the doctors so far today, I don't know about this problem. Most of children that suffer this problem are not able to get cured. So they are not able to tell the doctor what they hear before. And I'm so lucky that I'm able to see the result. So, and on each and every one of those children, the vision improved, the brightness improved, the hearing improved, and that's why I'm able to be able to, to pinpoint the problem. It reach, each actually, uh, the problem really is in the input device, the eye and the ear and the processor inside from the signal they receive to the perception center. There's some kind of mislink uh, in between, which make it difficult for them to understand what's happening around them. <coughs> okay, so um, also the another thing that you probably notice that those children are very insensitive to pain. If they fall down from, a, you know, a, 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 from bed or from some place that's high, they will not cry. Or somehow they bump their head on the wall, they won't cry. I mean, normal children, they would cry, okay, but they won't. Why? It's because the sensation on the nerve is very, is very blunt, it's very dull, it's not able to sense all this pain at all. So sometimes those children get burned, don't even know they get burned, or they cut bleeding with blood, they don't even know because there's no pain there. So pain is another thing that actually is deficiency in those children. Along with this sensation, it also suffered smelling problem, taste problem, and warm and cold, and that's kind of temperature problem. So sometimes people get burned, those children get burned without even notice because they turn on hot water, they don't know about it's hot. It's beyond the normal temperature range that they can use, so they get burned. So this is another problem that I noticed. Actually, uh, some of the uh, websites I'm sure you visit and, and look at have also addressed that problem too. And I see most of those children that visit me actually have mistreated, have this problem to only certain degree. Some is very serious to a point that, you know, it can pinch them very hard, they don't f feel a thing. And some are very, uh, some of those children are self-abusive. They hit themselves, they hit their head on the wall, um, they use the, you know, the step on their hand with their own feet. I mean, you look at them, it's unbelievable. That's what I'm, they don't feel the pain at all. Okay, so this is one thing that I noticed quite common in those children. Although some of them, you know, may be severe, some to a degree that they have no sense at all. Some may be not as sensitive as a normal person. But as the treatment progress and those senses coming back, and they are able to tell me they are feeling more and more compared to before treatment. So basically, um, this is pretty much, you know, I think cover most of the general symptoms you may observe on those children. Now, like I said, this name is called, this disease name is called autism spectrum disorder. So it's a cover a wide spectrum of problems. So one child may have a combination of this kind of problem. One may cover this, some of this. It very seldom you run into a child have exactly the same problem. Very, very seldom. So you have to be very keen on the observation to see what kind of problem they have. For the past seven years, I've been able to see a total of about 50, over 50 uh, these children. It varies from three years old to uh, about 20, 21. And um, so through this uh, lengthy research and, and studies, I found out some of those data that are not covered in any websites or any kind of medical journals which I'd like to share with you today. Okay, so that covered pretty much about the symptoms of the autistic children, although I can go into more detail, but I think we'll limit my time. So I'd like to brush it through it first, and then when we have time, we'll talk further about it. And the second uh, subject I'd like to talk about is the causes. Now, as of today, if you read, you, I'm sure you people probably have visited some vis uh, websites about this uh, autism problem particularly for parents who have autistic child or children. I'm sure you already have done a lot of research on your own. They'll find out the cause, you know, what's happening around the world about this disorder problem, okay? So the causes I want to mention to you um, basically cover seven items. The first four 
is pretty much cover by most of the websites or the people in medical journal articles about autism. But I'm still going to talk about it. And then I'll cover some extra points, three more points that is not mentioned very much in the ordinary writings or articles about autism that I, uh, through my own research, I came out with this data. Of course, my, my uh, patience in this research project is limited. It's only, uh, like I said, about 40, uh, not 50, a uh, little over 50. But that gives me some statistic that can point to what certain things, why it happened, you know. So I'm going to talk about that. Okay, the first thing that we uh, ever know about that is from genetics. Genetics from the family um, uh, problem. If you're a family member, uh, somehow in your branch have some problem, have some um, family member have this problem, the chances are for your family or for you to have a child of this, it could be higher than the family that do not have this kind of children. So that is related to genetic problem, okay? So uh, that's a very, I'm sure, um, talk about everywhere about this genetic problem. And the second, we talk about heavy metal contaminations. Heavy metal, uh, that actually could be toxin when they enter into the brain. And uh, well, nowadays we are exposed to all these, you know, I mean, chemicals in different forms. So it's so easy to be uh, taken into uh, the um, uh, children uh, through food or, or breathing or other contacts and without even knowing. Uh, there are quite a few labs in the United States that are able to use the hair to diagnose how much heavy metal toxin you have in your body. And uh, I'm sure you people know about that. And by using a hair alone, you can analyze the content of the toxin, or heavy metal content inside your body. Um, first, we'll talk about maybe mercury. Mercury is one of those items very commonly used in tooth fillings. And in the tooth fillings, about 50% of that is mercury. Um, and then also, like, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, the preservatives on the vaccination, they use mercury. It's called timerosal. It's a mercury product. And also some of those deep sea fish, like tuna, uh, swordfish, um, uh, salmon, and they also have intoxication of mercury because of the contamination uh, in the ocean. So those things that you eat those raw fish or raw nut, they're going to get into your bloodstream, and that eventually will stay in your brain. That becomes a toxication, intoxication for your brain. And um, copper, of course, very commonly used. Uh, you're going to have it in the utensils, kitchen utensils. I'm sure every family have a part that have a copper you know, bottom, which enhance the, uh, the heat transfer. But by the same token, every time you boil something in the soup or fry with it, you're gonna have some copper iron, uh, iron coming out, or the element will come out of it, and that makes it your food and you intake, you know, and then will eventually enter your bloodstream and go to the head. Now everything, those toxins, if it stay inside your body, is not as bad, but they normally go through the liver and when you get to a certain excessive amount, it will go to the head or the brain through the bloodstream. So it normal, uh, normally, you know, that's why the hair can detect all these heavy, toxic, uh, heavy uh, metal contents. Uh, also, like uh, antimony. Antimony is quite commonly used in carpets for fire retardant, pajama, um, things like that, fire retardant material. So uh, a lot of time, everyone in the family has carpets, so the children play on the carpet. So with contact on the carpet elements, and they're going to absorb some of those elements into the body without knowing. So that's another factor. And also um, aluminum, quite often used nowadays in aluminum parts, but although I'm very strongly opposed using it as a cooking utensil, but still there are a lot of people use it without knowing the problem that can generate. Um, so aluminum, also oxide, is also used in toothpaste that everyone, you brush your teeth with aluminum oxide, and you don't even know that sometimes, you know, you get into your teeth and stay there. So aluminum becomes another toxin that easily enter your bloodstream. Okay, so uh, chromium, uh, cadmium, um, so some of those are rare uh, material, but still that today's, you know, I mean utensils or, or things that you use, you know, uh, we normally come in contact without knowing. Lead, for example, is very common. In old days before 1972, 
uh, they have these, uh, actually, uh, they have those paint that are lead, you know, that contain, con contain a lot of lead in there, but nowadays they have lead-free paint. Uh, but sometimes you go to some, you rent some old houses and those paint are still, you know, have lead content in it, so that can affect the children's health as well. Um, also, the pipes that in the olden days, they use those, uh, you know, plumbing, they're all with lead and sort of joints, things like that, they have con consists of lead. So when drinking the water, and the water con con uh, consists of those uh, particles of lead that can be also very toxic to your brain too. So we talk about all these heavy metals, and uh, it's quite the number of them. In fact, the children that came to see me from last seminar uh, on June, they all brought their report to see, to let me see it. And most of them have the heavy metal content uh, analysis and look at those charts, you'll be amazed how much heavy metal the child have their body, even they are three, four years old. So um, it's amazing. So all these things, you know, actually uh, can become uh, intoxication for the brain and it will damage uh, the neural system, the brain functions to a great extent. So that is one thing that we should not overlook and be very careful how to avoid that. <coughs> Okay, the third main reason for the um, causes that is pretty much known is antibiotic. It's very widely and commonly used antibiotic nowadays. And um, I'm sure everyone are familiar with antibiotic. I'm sure you heard about it, use it to some degree, and particularly for the nowadays the children. You know, whenever they have any infection, they always use antibiotic as a common treatment. So the Actually, going back to the uh, 40s and 40s before 50, and they already have, at that time, they already using antibiotics. Okay, like penicillin at that time is one of the early form of antibiotic. Okay, but at that time, they use needle injection. At that time, they don't use oral uh, intake. So needle injection is quite different than oral intake. Why? When you inject something in the muscle, it will be absorbed in the bloodstream directly. So you go directly to the blood vessel, okay, instead of going through the gastrointestinal tract. But nowadays, actually starting about the uh, 60s, they start using oral intake. They use to take it through the mouth, okay. I'll talk about the antibiotic, you know, how it's been progressing as far as the usage is concerned starting the 40s, about 1949. At that time, based on some statistic, you know, uh, using needle injection, uh, the uh, production of the antibiotics about uh, 80 kiloton every year, before 50. And then about 10 years later, the usage of antibiotics has grown to 250 kilotons, more than three times what it was in the 40s. And besides that, they start using oral intake Oral intake is one of the biggest problems of all. Why? I try to explain it to you. It's very understood, easily understood that when you take something from the mouth, it goes through the esophagus and then the stomach and go to the duodenum, intestine, colon and all that, and then finally come out. Now through this process, we call that gastrointestinal tract. By doing that, the antibiotic will kill all the germs, bacteria, as you go along, as it moves along. Now, we all know the intestine, you know, is actually an important part of break down the food particles and to break into, uh, decompose into amino acids and eventually being absorbed into the um, uh, 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 bloodstream and then go to the liver and provide all the nutrition of the body, okay? But then uh, our intestine is consists of more than 500 different kind of species of bacteria. And they are actually some good ones, some bad ones. So they are a combination of all that to make the food particle to be broken down and be able to extract the uh, nutrition from it you know, into different kind of forms of amino acids that be usable and uh, beneficial to the body for nutrition. But then by using the antibiotic, as it go along, it's like killing bacteria inside the stomach and it started with the stomach and then keep going on to the intestine. So some of those good bacteria that actually is important for the digestion 
actually the breaking down of the food particles into usable forms has been killed to a great degree, to a large amount, to a point that the bad one become overgrown. The bad one is commonly known about as yeast, okay, yeast. And this kind, of, this kind of bacteria, I'm sure there are many different kinds of names, but this is one of the very commonly known as damaging to your health, yeast. Okay, so then the, because of the good bacteria dying and the overgrown of these bad bacteria and though the intestinal tract uh, 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 decomposition of the food particle become uh, totally disrupted. So because of the overgrown of this yeast product, there will be some byproducts that came out. That byproduct is the decomposition of the food that came up with something that could be harmful to your body. For example, one of the byproducts is called candida. I'm sure you heard about that. It's one of those germs, bacteria that is, uh, can be bad for your skin, or your, um, for a female disorders, you know, some, some kind of a, a skin problem. Candida have a different kinds of them too, and also there's some a name called Clostridia. Clostridia is some form of similar kind, but very common in a uh, imbalanced intestinal tract type of um, bacteria uh, distribution. So, so you can see the result. And suddenly, because of taking the antibiotic, you're killing the bad bacteria. Actually, affect or uh, affect your body like infection things like that. But also, in the same time, is killing all the good ones. They have no distinction or discrimination between the good and bad. They just kill. So when you lost all that good bacteria in the system, particularly inside your intestinal tract, what happened? Your bowel will become a problem. You become a constipation. You might have some kind of uh, totally um, you know, toxic material, you know, really become out of proportion in the system. Now, in the human body, the Immune system is most important for us to fight off the problem, infections, diseases, things like that. The immune system consists of the liver and the intestinal tract that will form a very complete immune system. So when, you, when the uh, yeast become overgrown, so they really you know, adhere to the surface, the membrane of the intestine. Uh, so by rooted into, actually deeply rooted into the uh, intestine, and they even break down the membrane tissue to a point that if you look at it through a microscope, you see the light pores like cheese, like German cheese or Swiss cheese, you know, the little hole here. So those holes become very pronounceable, pronounced that they were letting those particles go through. Because uh, normally when the food pass through the whole gas gastrointestinal tract, will go down to very fine particles. And those particles are normally being blocked off by the membrane of the intestine so that will not enter into the bloodstream. If those holes become prominent, so those particles not being broken down will enter into the uh, uh, intestine, actually, and enter into the bloodstream, eventually go into the liver. And that will become a problem. So people have a lot of allergic to a lot of different kinds of food, mainly it's because of that reason. So in other words, by using excessive or actually using, frequently using antibiotic will cause this problem and very easily to have food allergy problem, okay? Or even milk product allergy problem or different kind of, or even fruit or this kind of thing, okay? So that taking antibiotic can have this very bad effect on the body. Okay, so uh, I'm sure you all know you're taking a whole course of antibiotic, you're going to probably find out yourself very weak, and all you find out be easy, feel like they're stuffy, bloated stomach, and want to throw up, and all these other side effects too, besides, you know, the intestinal problem that I just talked about. <coughs> so you see how extent, the, the de how, how, you know, the, 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 the extent of damage could be by frequently taking antibiotic. Okay, the whole system will break down, broken down. When your immune system broke down, every problem comes up. Disease, okay, different kind of disease, cancer, any kind of problem will come up because your the lack of defense is completely stripped off by that. When you have no defense system in your body, bacteria, all these things are gonna grow. So this is one thing that I like to emphasize. Uh, in fact, it's pretty much talked about in many uh, websites, you know, people, uh, in Western medicine about that too. Um, the, um, 
the over actually for a child, you know, that's about even a few months old. Sometimes they suffer ear infection. It's quite common that they use they have ear infection problem up to a few years old. And normally, the doctors here in Western medicine they will use antibiotic as a rule, pretty much. There's no other way. But actually, the best way to find out this ear infection is let it heal by itself, not to use any kind of medication. Let the body fight it off. There's some study have been done, um, uh, a group of doctors in Holland, and compared to the American doctors. In Holland, they do not use you know, that much of antibiotic for treating ear infection. They let, it, let, the, let the child heal. And then the difference is, although the antibiotic make a very Im immediate recovery, the infection goes down very quickly, but the re occurring is very common and have three, four times as much as the, the one that had let it heal by itself because the body will build up the antibody, build up the resistance, and then will not reoccur as frequent as the one used antibody. So that is <coughs> one of those, that, those things that um, uh, some doctors have done uh, extensive research on, um, comparing antibiotic and not using antibiotic, and, and that's a result. Uh, it's actually uh, quite apparent. Okay, so um, antibiotics, we talk about that, how it affects the intestinal tract imbalance of the different material. They actually allow the bad bacteria to overgrow to a point in our proportion that really, you know, make the body go bad. So some of the most damaging material is the byproducts of those bad bacteria. For example, tartaric acid and all the kind of toxin generated from those, you know, bad bacteria eventually will enter into the bloodstream and then go to the liver and then go up to the head and stay in the head. Now those stuff can be very damaging to the brain. So there's another thing in addition to heavy metal can be damaging to the child's brain and that actually make the, fun fun the brain function uh, slow down or being degenerated or degraded because of that. <clears throat> okay, so there's another thing I'll talk about. So far we talk about the heavy metals, genetic and antibiotic. Now we talk about another controversial uh, uh, items is vaccinations. Now in this country, you know, actually for the past 34 years maybe, uh, people are taking vaccination for smallpox. Now in my, you know, going back to my age at the time, you know, when I was in high school, we were forced to take those smallpox and, and some of those shots, okay? Not a whole lot, maybe four or five, that's about it, polio shot, things like that. But nowadays, you look at those records of the child, they have over 20 to 30 different kinds of vaccination, you know, when they are very young, you know, when they are one year old to two years old. Before, if they don't take those shots, they are not able to go into any kind of schools or even kindergarten. They look at your record. If you don't have it, they don't let you go in. So this is one of those requirements you have to fulfill. But in fact, by looking at those records of those children, I found out that a lot of times those Children, when they are born the first day or the second day, they will have the first shot. The first shot normally is hepatitis B. Now those things really is, is very uh, bad, although they are very old viruses injecting the body. But the infant, when they're first born, they are not ready to take any kind of viruses or any kind of bad things, you know, for the body. They have to build it up in time. This just came out about one day or two days, and they have to face this hardship to, to fight with this old bacteria or, or virus, okay? And they're not ready. So oftentimes, and from some of those papers written, that children that have those shots, they have big problem. They have respiratory, respiratory problem, and they have even um, uh, become, you know, like they're going to very uh, difficult uh, movement, like the hand and legs are totally weak, they cannot move around. Uh, things like that. So the vaccination is one of the big problems that I think that cause the um, you know, autism. Although it's very controversial, and you see one side of it says no, it's not, and the other side says yes, it is. But so far, from what we learn from the uh, uh, different articles, there's a group now is joined together in England in trying to bring a lawsuit to the pharmaceutical company who manufacture MMR. MMR is a three-in-one injection vaccination. It's called mumps, 
rubella, uh, measles and mumps and rubella. Okay, and those families, they notice that children after injection, within hours or a few days, the children will stop talking, lost their speech capability. So those things are actually very obvious. In fact, you can probably see, you can read articles about that. And although the pharmaceutical company uh, are certainly denying that uh, this is the, the, the case, and they're still talking about it, but as of today, that I know in Japan, they already banned using uh, MMR 3-in-1 for children vaccination. Um, they can use separately, but not together. So another one is called DPT. Okay? DPT is another one is you know, injected 3-in-1. Now remember, those kind of viruses, although they are dead or they are old, so, so they kind of give your body a little stimulation to create antibody to, to uh, fight off these things if they you know, become infected. But when the, when the body or the infant is so weak sometimes, or not in a very good condition, those weak viruses can be very fatal to them. They're not able to fight it off. Or may, they may actually suffer a fever. Actually, a lot of times those people after the shots have fever. Now, fever will happen. What happened? Why does that happen? Because the brain has some inflammation. The blood vessel inflammated, okay? What that happened is there's some blood vessel busted, bursted, okay? So that can create a problem, which I'll talk about later on about those blood clot problem. Okay, so it's like a micro um, meningitis that happened to the child. Every time you give them vaccination, and very often time they have fever. Maybe one day it's gone, okay? If you, you see that, doesn't mean there's no problem because that one day the body tries to fight off but you already have inflammatory type of vessel, blood vessel inside the brain and that can have a small little area being damaged without being noticed. If they are in an area that is not important to the function, you won't notice it, but it happens so happen into a speech area or in a certain area that is critical in body functions, you're going to notice it. And that also being written in quite a few articles. Actually, I've read about in websites, and there's a parent group they form right now in the Bay Area, I think. Um, they're trying to, um, I'm not sure exactly where, I forgot that location, but they try to join together to, uh, 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 to ask the parent not to have the vaccination shot too quickly, too soon, okay? So, uh, although it is controversial um, problem, it's not, uh, for sure it is causing it, but there are numerous cases that has been, you know, written about right after the vaccinations, the child become, you know, really having a problem in uh, talking, in, in walking, or all these other functions suddenly stopped. So that must have some relation with the infection or actually vaccination, okay? So we cannot afford to have one child in a family to be autistic. So there will be a too high a price to pay to not to pay attention to this controversial problem. So how are we going to avoid it? The school all require this kind of vaccination. How are you going to avoid it? So from my study and through all these years of study, I think there are certain ways to get by, although it may not be 100% good, but that can be uh, helpful to prevent that to happen. Instead of giving them the first shot, hepatitis B, wait until a few months later. Wait until the infant is more adjustable, adapt to the environment first. Give them a few months. Make sure the, the, uh, the milk is proper for them and all these other things. Sometimes take them months to find out what is the best milk for them, you know? Even that takes that long time to find out, to let them adapt to. Why give them something so detrimental and destructive? Okay, so instead of the first day, give them six months later. Okay, you're not going to in the area like uh, Southeast Asia, they have hepatitis B. You're not going there. So why worry about hepatitis B that early? All right, the second thing is if you have to take all these shots, make sure you take them while the baby is healthy. When there's no coughing, there's no flu, there's no fever, or any kind of weaknesses appeared at that time. Then give them one shot, not multi-shot, not three in one, not five in one, one shot at a time. And just phase them out at least one month when the body recover from the last shot, then go to the next one. Give it a little more time. Give the body adjust, adjust to all these kind of things to fight it off, okay? 
So that will be, I think, helpful to prevent all these things go in at one time. Okay. Nowadays they are talking about mega shots, mega vaccination. You talk about hundred of these vaccination be injected into the babies. See, it can be a lot more. These kind of problems going to appear. I think now. All these children come to see me, they all have records of vaccination. They all have uh, over 20 different kinds of vaccinations for the children. So that is a common, you know, I mean, uh, uh, data or statistic that, that I'm looking at. I'm sure this is the same thing happened across the world, not just in Hong Kong or United States, because there's a civilization that bring up to immunization. And that also bring up to another problem, so we have to deal with right now, okay? So the world is changing. So we have to cope with all these problems that happen. We cannot make ourselves blind that we don't see the problem. Now remember, all these vaccinations being produced, they are produced by big pharmaceutical companies. They are very powerful. They are very powerful. They have a lot of money. If they say it's no, that's no. If you fight it off, you're going to spend a lot of money to fight in illegal cases. And yet you may not win. So, Sometimes the doctor is only the one who recommends use those things. They don't. They, all they see is the, the, the results. They don't do the research. Is the pharmaceutical company do the research? And yet they don't have the statistic that direct with the child. Okay. So sometimes it will take long time to find out the cause and be able to pinpoint a problem. Hundred percent. Yes, that is the cause of one of those major causes for autism. But through all these years before that being confirmed, the children, the parents, the family suffered. And it's, if you have seen some of the children in the family that have those children, it's very heartbreaking. I have seen many. I have seen many. I just, it's very heartbreaking. That's why I'm not putting a lot of time in this area to hope that I can help those families and those children to bring back their normal functions. Okay, so, so much about vaccination that how to prevent, uh, how to, uh, you know, take it. Oh, there are actually some uh, uh, law that you, if you believe in certain religion or certain thing, you can avoid taking those uh, vaccination, but I don't know how to go about it. Uh, last time in the seminar, there's one uh, audience that actually bring up that, uh, uh, the point that you can go to apply for that for religious reason or for personal reason that to, uh, to be um, uh, uh, exempt from taking those vaccinations. And there are some schools actually are taking those children without those uh, vaccination. Okay, so if you want to go further, uh, you can probably look into it. And okay, so there's a fourth reason pretty much uh, talk about in the uh, websites you can find and a lot of organization about autis autism and the medical journal, things like that. Now we come to t three more. Um, uh, data that I'm going to talk about, three more items that I think from my collections of data that could be quite interesting to know about. Um, one is the overage of the uh, mother when they have the first child. When I say overage, I don't mean 40. I mean, I mean 30, which is very young nowadays uh, thinking. Uh, nowadays, we know that the uh, generation talking about late marriage, late have children, all these things is another is a contributing factor for having autistic children. The reason I say that is from my statistics, each and every one of those child that come to see me, the mother is over 30. If not exactly, they be just on the borderline of 30. Okay, so that gives me some data that is on everyone they're consistent. So they must be, bear some importance about the results, okay? Why? In my opinion, I think the eggs actually has been over it for a long time. It's getting old. So when they're not being, you know, used, you know, I mean, just like any cell, the cell get old as well. It's a cell. The cells get old. Now, actually, there's a paper came out on September 5th on San Jose Mercury. I'm not sure you guys read about that. They talk about an old dad can give more chances of the children. When he say old, he don't mean 40. He said 30. It's very similar to my research that 30 of a mother. You understand that? When the mother is 30, they have first child, in normal, in ordinary society, the father must be older than 30. 
So that actually can be consistent with their findings on that article, actually published on September 5th on Centers of Mercury, which is actually reprinted uh, from LA Times or something like that. I have the article, so if you guys are interested, in, you know, you can have a copy of that. Uh, so that, as of September 5th, I saw the article, it confirmed my data through my seven years of research is correct to some degree. And you know, I talk about the mother, because most of the time the, the mother delivered the child, so it's very easily and to be understood, you know, the mother could be a contributing factor because the egg is not new egg, they're old eggs. Where the sperm is different, the sperm is continuously generated in the male's body. Although when the body gets old, the, 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 the factory may get a little defective. If it gets defective, the sperm may get a little problem that carry on to the genetics. That may be a problem, okay? But in general, I think the male, I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, because they have, you know, a, a, a new sperm that generated continuously it compared to the old eggs inside uh, the, the female body, that would make a little difference. But, this, but what, no matter what it is, you know, we all now know that age is a contributing factor for having those children, which we have to look at seriously. In other words, we have to convince the world, convince the young generation that don't have late marriage. You make sure you go have children before 30. But that is hard to do. The trend is now going later and later in marriage, okay? Later and later to have children. So, but that is a social problem that we have to face. That's one statistic I found out. The second is the uh, uh, problem or complication during the delivery of the children, of the child. Okay, for example, some people like to uh, use induction to have the child on a certain date. So they use induction method to have the child come out earlier. Okay, and in fact, quite a few of those child, that uh, the autistic ch child's uh, mother use that method too. And also sometimes they have their lack of, I mean their delay in the first breath when they come out. Okay, so, uh, so that will kind of uh, causing a, a, a lack of oxygen in the brain that can also create some damage to the brain function you know, for the further development in the brain. Um, and also, the, sometimes they use forceps you know, to get the uh, child out because of difficulty in coming out. So when they use forceps, they create some blood clots. In fact, sometimes you see the eye with blood you know, and things like that or uh, the form of the head, things like that. And then also there's another way they take it out is through of suction. By using a suction cup, they pull them out. Now that is even worse. By using a suction cup, you're pulling the blood out of the capillaries. So there a lot of blood will be coming out of the inside the brain and eventually form blood clots in the head. Okay, this is just like those love marks that you have in the neck, right? When you suck it and you see the blood comes out. So that is um, become a problem the, later on. Okay, and then um, so, you know, any kind of medication that is not normally being used, you know, can also create some uh, complication for the child. And so that is the birth complication is a second issue that I found out is they all, most of them, they run into some problem when the delivery of the first child. The third, the third items that I have found is one of the major cause too, is because of falling down, you know, concussions because of falls, and because of hitting the head somewhere, uh, impacts, all these can create concussions, and that can result in blood clots in the head. Now, I'll keep talking about blood clots. This is the key word I'll be using for the rest of the seminar, because that, in fact, is the major problem causing autism. Okay, so the third item we talk about is accidents that can uh, cause blood clots for the children, for a little child. Now, if they fall down from the bed, he may cry for a little while, and then you try to rock him a little bit, okay, you know, good girl, good boy, then it stop crying. But then the little blood that spilled out or because of the impact that will stay there for a long time. If so happened that blood clot, it lie in the critical area, then when he grow up, that function will become a problem or defective and will show up. But if in an area that is not usable brain function, then you will not see any problem. So it depends where that blood clot lies, okay, so that is. Those seven items we talk about the cause of autism. So, um, and then, uh, let's see. I'm gonna, 
Con okay. All right. Okay, so next thing I'm going to talk about is in the uh, treatment now. In the, uh, first, I want to talk about the uh, ordinary ways that Western medicine, how they treat them. Well, as all we know, as of today, this disease is labeled incurable across the world. Uh, for, my st for my treatment, I would say this is treatable and curable to some degree, can be as good as to 80 to 90 percent, or even to a point that you don't even notice at all. But it takes a long time. The time for me to treat and make it you know, really normal and, and progressing steadily, at least one year. Okay, take at least one year. But let's first talk about the Western medicine, how they do it. Okay, um, first of all, they have major, the, the, the most commonly used methods by controlling diet. Controlling diet, like, you know, they want to have the gluten-free food, they have the uh, casein-free food, okay? Those two items is very stressed on to try to be uh, avoid. Okay, by avoiding them, the child will see improvements and some of the hyperactivity may slow down. But then you have to continue to do that you know, without stopping. If you stop on that and the problem comes back up right away. So they are very limited to how, what kind of food they can take because of these limitations. The casein food is like a cheese product and uh, like ice cream, things like that. <clears throat> and sometimes the chocolate is a problem too because that actually induces hyperactivity. Every time they take some chocolate, you see they become wild. So that also, uh, they try to prevent uh, excessive sugar or chocolate, this sort of thing, entering the bloodstream. And then also they use uh, some kind of antifungal drug like nystatin to kill off those bad bacteria. okay? Uh, by doing that, they also encourage using garlics and other you know, natural intake of food to avoid having too many of this kind of bad bacteria you know, overgrown inside the intestinal tract. So diet control is one of the key area for helping those children to cut down or slow down the symptoms of the problem. It never be able to cure them, okay? And um, there's another thing they use for people who cannot talk, do not talk right, they use speech therapy or occupational therapies to help them out. How to interact with people, how to look at people, how to you know, stay in the crowd, be able to play with the group, things like that. It's using artificial means to force them into that environment so that they will interact. It's not through natural uh, behavior. Rather, it's you know, compulsory to force them. It's, they call them therapists, but actually they try to force them to go into a certain pattern of you know, social behavior. Um, so this is uh, uh, normally commonly used. And it's speech therapists, and they try to teach them how to pronounce, how to use the tongue, how to uh, watch the mouth. But actually, you think about it. If the person cannot hear you right, they cannot see you right, no matter what you do, you're not able to teach them. That's why recently I have a child, uh, actually 17 years old. He cannot even pronounce his own last name. You can tell him 100 times, he still come up with the wrong sound. His father said, forget it. He will never be able to say it. Although I can make him say it in one week. Okay, so the problem really is the hearing problem. The moment you tell him something, he goes through the eardrum, and then after processing it, it becomes encrypted signal. It's not recognizable voice at all. So he, and he tried to imitate that sound that he heard after processing. It's not the same sound you came out. So he will never be able to actually imitate your true voice. And that's the problem. If I can straighten out this processor, eliminate all this garbage that created from the processor, then become a true sound, then you know what you say, then by watching your mouth, he'll be able to follow it. And that happens can be as quick as one, one week compared to 17 years in his life. You see how the difference is? I've seen it happens all the time in my children, I mean the, the child that I'm treating. So, so the therapy can be useful only to a limited degree because of the input restrictions, the input, the input limitations of the hearing, the input limitation of the visual you know, perception of what they see. So, and that make it hard for the speech therapy and the occupational therapies to really do the job right. Okay, okay so this is the um, uh, Western method you know, of treating autism concern. So 
Um, they see some good results by using nystatin, this sort of antifungal drug, but then you've got to take it continuously. If you don't, it comes back right away. It can sometimes even really uh, worse than before. So this is the, the theory they're using, mainly from the uh, bottom up. You know, look at the feces, look at the urine, and then try to, how to get rid of all these di uh, bacteria. So they look at that and try to come up with a reason what the cause actually happened in the brain. So that's why, as of today, there's no cure. They couldn't find the causes of it. But for me today, I'm talking not from one up, but from the brain down. By doing that, I'm able to create a lot of problems that is not explainable. It's the brain function I'm working on. I'll be able to correct that. Once I correct that, that person cannot see, can see again, you know, cannot see color, can see color again, and you see, you know, really uh, amazing results by my theory. Okay, so, so much for that. I think I'll go into the treatment, the method I use. Uh, I call this Owl's Brain Theory. Through the seven years research, I come up with this theory. It not only is actually to able to help those children who have autism, but also I can use that theory, apply on Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, brain disorders, depression problems, um, stroke recovery, it all work. So this is one of very powerful theory I came out for the past seven years, and I'll be able to formulate it and make it consistent. I see results that I come out consistent to what I, uh, my hypothesis. That's why I call it a theory instead of hypothesis now. It's able to be proven. Okay. Now, first of all, um, let me do this. Just a second. Okay, now let's talk about brand new area. Let's talk about how the brain works now, okay? And uh, we know about this problem now, so let's talk about the fundamentals, how the brain works. Let's assume we're standing here, and suddenly I hear a sound, bam, on that side, on the right side. And what I'm going to do, first of all, I hear the sound. The second I'm going to do is turn my head. I want to look at what happened over there. And then, through the sound level, I want to recognize it, whether it's explosion, whether it's a big music, or whether it's a firecracker. In a split second, I got to find out what is the nature of the sound. And then also, you have to analyze it, whether they have some danger for me, to me. Okay? If it is, then I have to run. How? Should I cover my head? Now, all these things happen in a split second and the, the brain will tell you what to do. You may have to run, you may have to, whatever it is. So the hearing input will trigger all these functions inside the brain for you to decide what to do. So you see the, 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 the brain is very powerful. Actually, I tried it because my background is in, in electrical engineering and uh, my past experience in designing computer disk drives and circuit theory and automatic control systems. So the brain works so closely as a computer, except it's much more powerful than the computer. OK, now, through all these memories that we have stored in the past, you know what kind of sound it is, whether it's dangerous or not. And then all these things, it happened in such a short time that you will know what to do. You may want to run, or you want to just kind of you know, I mean, cover your head, things like that. So what I'm trying to say is, the signal that travels into your ear to be processed in such a short time is not transmitted in the form of chemical reactions in the nervous system. It must transmit in a very fast way. Now that is what I call electromagnetic waves. And that theory I discovered and being proven later on in my studies, okay? So you see that just like a, a radio in Moscow, you turn on the radio, if I have the station tuned to that frequency, I'll be able to hit just like that. It doesn't take any time, it's so fast. So it's, it's less than speed of light, but it's very close, it's very fast, okay? In fact, there's an article, I read about it in the website one time, about the optical signal from the, the eye is transmitted to the brain in the, uh, very close to electromagnetic waves. And they talk about that. Uh, there's a name for that, the term of the, what kind of megabit transmission, but I just so happened I didn't have it today. So that pretty much is consistent with my finding. The brain 
is transmit the signal in the brain is traveling and transmitted at very fast speed, that like a radio station. Okay. Now let's look at this. Um, this is a very basic uh, 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 game that we use when we are a child. Now we put those matchbox and put a little membrane in the bottom, and you try to connect them with a wire, and then you can talk on one side, the other side can hear it very clearly. Have you tried that when you are young? Okay, a very interesting toy. One is like a mouthpiece, the other one is an ear, earphone, right? So you can hear talking back and forth. Now, I assume there are two pairs of people here. One is in the green, one is in the red, okay? So there are two. This is the uh, mouthpiece here, and there's the earphone on the other side. Now, this is a wire that pulls very straight and tight. So the voice waves are able to propagate through it. On this side, I assume we have a low frequency. On this side, we assume we have a high frequency, okay? So when both of these lines are being spaced away, each person on the other end is able to receive the voice clearly and probably the same amplitude as the way we talk on the input side. We call this input, this is the output. Okay, and then as you, I'm sure you know what's going to happen if someone's going to put a finger and snap on the wire, what's going to happen on that receiving end? You're going to lose all that sound, right? Because the voice waves, you know, the sound waves is completely stopped because you put a stop on the wire. By the same token, when those two lines, when those two lines are getting closer and closer together, and finally they're touching together, what's going to happen? The sound will drop to a point it's very small, and those signals together will be superimposed together, be suppressed and superimposed. So what you see instead of this basic signal, you see a small low frequency signal, and also the little bit of high frequency is actually wiggling on top of it. I try to magnify it like this, you'll see a big low frequency. Actually, it's not big. I'm talking about very small now. So you see the red, or this is the red one, this green one. So you see a very suppressed low amplitude signal. Okay. In other words, you lost most of the voice. Okay, but you do hear a little bit of it because of the crosstalk. It's called crosstalk. Okay. All right. Let's expand it to uh, multi lines. Okay. We have different color here. I'm sure you see very clearly here. We have yellow, green, and blue, and black and red. Okay, representing you know different kind of line. Now, if everyone on the other end is listening, as long as they are spaced out, each and every one of them can hear the other side very clearly. But as they lost that space between them, and they skip, start touching each other. The one that's touched together, you're going to lose the signal, okay? And you have crosstalk, but the crosstalk will be so small that you might not be affecting, you may not be able to hear it or do anything. Let's suddenly talk about this is not the line of the earphone. Let's talk about this is a nerve system. Consider all these color lines to be nerve, transmitting signals, okay, from different part of the body, or input from the eye or from the hearing or whatever. What's going to happen? Either you lost some of those signals or actually crossed with some other signals. It's no longer the true signal that's supposed to be transmitting. So that is what happened in your brain. Normally, each and every one of those axons are shielded with myelin. Myelin is like, just like a coaxial cable. You know, you shield it with the ground. Okay, so even the touching each other, you're having that shield in between them. So the signal will not be affected. So be able to transmit to the proper paces with the proper amplitude and things like that. It's a complete true signals. But the moment you start getting this signal to be crossed or touching each other or the myelin being stripped off, then the signal or the axon will be, you know, touching each other. The signal will not be able to perform normally or propagate normally as it should. Okay? Now those myelins is a form of fatty acids. These acids actually, you know, surround actually uh, the, the, the axon. Uh, one thing I talked about earlier about the toxin entering your body because of the uh, yeast byproduct. And one form of that is called tartar acid. It's a crystals that actually can damage into your health, to your kidney, and also when it enter into your bloodstream, when it go and stay in the blood, I mean the brain, it's going to damage your brain cell, your, 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 your neuron system because of the axon, uh, the shield we stripped off. 
Okay, when that being stripped off, you have all kind of problem. The signal transmission become a mess. It's no longer able to transmit signals. You have all kind of unwanted signal. You know, instead of go to one place, go to ten different places, and on, and yet it's much smaller signal, and that's why causing hyperactivity. Okay, because that's the, all these signals involuntary. The child running around doesn't mean that he wants to run around. It's involuntary. He don't even know it himself. Okay, so by trying to extrapolate what I put down here as a two-line transmission, an earphone uh, principle can apply to nerve system as well. Okay, so that pretty much explains the fundamentals about the signal transmission in the brain, in voice, in every way. It's the same. So, you know, it, it's no different. Now let's go one step further. Well, I try to correlate the brain with cores. Now this is a really a big breakthrough in my research, you know. How do I make a model of a brain so that I can simulate, you know, the uh, occurring, you know, the, what happened in the brain to a point that we understand. Um, Today, actually going back to about 30 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we are in the analog world. Analog means the signal size, amplitude, frequency, things like that is analog signal. Okay? We deal with that all the time. Um, so that is the analog world we've been talking about. But actually since 1960, the late 60s, then they started with digital signals. Uh, computers start, you know, come in the world. They use binary system. Binary system is not based on amplitude. It's based on one, zero, one, zero, this type of combinations. It's called digital systems. Nowadays, you see everywhere, like digital camera, digital this, digital that. It's all digital. That is what we have today. The state of the art is called digital world, OK? So let's take what we have today, the digital world. We talk about binary signals, which is a one or zero. The combination of that will make all kinds of combinations. You can transform it back uh, into convert it back to analog signal anywhere you want, you, you want, you know. Just like the AM in the old day being changed into FM. You know, amplitude modulation change into frequency modulation. Uh, as all you know, FM stations are much stable than amplitude or the AM system or AM radio because they are easier to process. Okay, now so far we are only talking about binary data. And I will use that as a basis to explore the similarities or analogy of the cores with the brain. So it happened I'm a double E major, so I know quite a bit about these kind of things. Um, but actually, let's go further beyond binary. What do we have beyond that? Let's say 10 years from now, or 50 years from now, what do we have? Are we still in this binary world? Probably not. Let's talk about that. Let's say we have a paper here. It's only two dimension, and there are some people who live inside the two dimension world. You tell them, there's a third dimension there. There's height. You say, no, no, there's only two dimension. It's only length and width. How can it be a third dimension? Not until you come out of that paper and go into a three dimension world, you will never know there's a third dimension there. Right? So we have height. In this world, we have height, three dimension. Length, width, and height, three dimension. Right? Not until Einstein came out with time. That become the fourth dimension. Okay, that make the world much broader now. Okay, you see movies like Time Machine and all this sort of thing, you know, go back in age and all that. So that is very already unthinkable. Even now, you think about time, okay? How can you go back in age, you know, if you try to travel a machine that faster than light speed of light. Now I'm sure nowadays you still I still don't know why and how, but there's been proven it can be like that. Now what about the fifth dimension? There may be another dimension that we don't even know about, and we never thought about the fifth dimension. You know what that is? I'm going to tell you what that is. It's called mind reading. They can look at you and take your thought, or they can look at you and transmit the thought, and you know what you want. That's what we call God, or this spirit, or Holy Spirit, whatever you call it that area in the fifth dimension. But it's beyond us now at this, at this point. I think very highly likely that our brain works in much higher form than binary form. So the whole partial of energy that with all the data will transmit to you and dump to you just like that. Instead of zero or parallel, they go one partial, they go into your brain. And you know what that person wants. Or you can actually you know, just 
do this kind of thing in a much faster way. And I think the brain probably work in this way. But we're not able to, to cope with it or be able to really analyze it in this kind of form yet. We don't have the tool to do that. But let's talk about binary right now. I assume we have a binary world, we have a pulse. A pulse is a one, and then it can be a zero and so forth, okay? Now, uh, first of all, I will treat the neuron. This is a neuron, okay? I use one model, one neuron. is a cell, and it's, a, it's a nerve cell that actually, uh, when a child is born, they have some, there are quite a few of these neurons actually spread over in his brain, but actually they don't have the brain yet. The brain is called dendrites, okay? So as time goes on, you learn how to speak, you learn how to walk, and, and then those branches will spread and start connecting each other up. It's like a network. I didn't draw it up here because it don't have limited by space. But then all these things are touching each other. And um, so it forms a network. So as you grow older, those networks will become bigger and larger. It's more sophisticated, so they know what to do. Uh, a person with very good, uh, sophisticated person be able to tell what you want by looking at you. The way how you act, you can you know what your behavior is, right? So that all from the, you know, the network, the complexity of the network, okay? And also have an axon. The axon is the transmitted decision uh, of the what you're gonna do. So it go to the cerebellum and to execute uh, motions or any kind of body movements, things like that. So this is uh, the neuron, one neuron. So I try to correlate this with a coil. Now, not one coil, but can be even multiple coils. Let's talk about one coil first. So let's say I assume there's a coil here that actually when a pulse, a pulse is actually represented by a single electrical pulse, okay, with electrical energy, and that will generate flux lines. I'm gonna speed through this part because I'm sure some people may not be interested, but I still have to let you know the uh, big picture of it. Okay, this is called primary coil that will generate flux lines. The flux lines will be able to couple through and then generate another signal. Assume this coil is very far away, then you'll see a very small signal, okay? But if you keep moving toward the other coil, even though with the air in between, the flux lines still can go through and generate a pulse. Now that pulse will be much smaller in amplitude because the the coefficient of inductance is very low because the air is very low in that. But if we try to replace that with a core, a core is a ferric core. Now, let's talk about a ferric core. The ferric core is the basic memory unit in the old days. When I say the old days, I mean 1950 to 60s, okay? IBM came out with this memory, not a chip, but the cores. So by using the cores, they can remember what's happening and be able to perform a computer's functions. So in the old days, you know, by talking about, you know, kilo, kilo bit, you have a whole big computer, you know, that's like a room size, you know. But nowadays, you have a gigabyte in the chip. So you see the big, you know, improvements uh, for the past 50 years. So this core actually is, is uh, made out of ferrite core. Ferrite is iron, okay, uh, uh, metallic iron. And then that is uh, very conductive as far as the inductance is concerned. And then if you try to couple it through, and you're gonna see a one-to-one. -one. I assume it's a very, uh, uh, very good inductance core. Then one input will generate one output, probably about the same amplitude, okay? So by using the same principle, I put more winding into it, then I'll see another result, just like a transformer. So you have a primary, you have a secondary signal. So that can be two or three or four or five, depending on how many coins you have. In other words, one signal can be branched out into three or four or even more. Now, just take the example we had to talk about earlier. When you hear a sound, bam, and then the sound go into your ear. And then it will start going to this core, the ring of course, that one go to decide on uh, dangers, one decide on, this, on the uh, uh, sound level, and what nature of the sound, you can go to all different places to recognize that sound, the nature. So one signal, you can split into all different signals to go into processing, and then at the end, you come up with a decision, and that decision is tell the person what to do through the axon to execute the motion to accordingly. Okay, so, so this is what happened inside the neuron. As it grow, you can have more coils inside the neuron. They're able to branch out and get the signal into at one time, go to different places, and be able to make a wise and uh, decision. Okay, so that's the complexity which I can using a common, uh, simple model to represent. Okay, so that is very important. So bear in mind now, we talk about ferrite core. Why ferrite? Not, why, not copper core. 
Now, ferrite is made of iron, and I will talk about the blood clots in length. The blood clots are formed actually basically with iron ions. That is very important. The ferrite is Fe3, valency of 3, okay, and that have a lot of effects on the brain functions. It's ferrite, okay, uh, ferrous iron. Okay, so that is why I use that as an analogy. Okay, let's talk about next one. So this is the multi-core configuration of what I just talked about. So within the neuron, now you can have the input and it's going to branch out into four different signals, and yet it can also still branch out as it grows, the child grows, and you have more complexity inside the neuron that can perform more functions, and to make the more data can split into different paths, it can make faster decisions. And that is uh, the multi-core configuration. Okay, now we talk about the brain is just like a computer. It consists of a lot of automatic control loops inside the brain. Just like earlier I said, when you hear a loud sound, you eventually you know, immediately want to turn and run or do something. That takes a lot of control loop to make that decisions. Okay, I'm going to use a very interesting uh, 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 way to show you how the brain can adjust the eyeball to fit the vision. Okay, in fact, you guys heard about cross eye, lazy eye, things like that. That's the why that happened. And I'm able to treat that. Um, I will show you how. <coughs> So let's look at the, uh, uh, am I talking, talking too fast or, okay? Okay, right, because I, they keep telling me I'm slow. <laughs> so, all right, so this is an object, okay? So you have two normal eyeball here, right side, left side, left eyeball. And assume we have a normal eye here. Everything is healthy, the nerve is good, the retina is good, okay? So you form a normal image on both eye, okay? So they are normal, everything is normal. So this signal probably is the optimal size of the image come from this one. So that's good, everything, the, the, the axis is looking good, it's called teaming. The eyeball is looking straight at the person or the object as it should be. Now, let's look at this one. Uh, uh, first of all, look, uh, look at this one. Now, the object again, right here, but assume we have some problem. Oh, let's, let's look at this one, better, better this one. Okay, we have an area of the retina being damaged or being have blockage. Okay, so this part is not functional anymore. And also maybe there's a certain area with blood clot that blocking the nerve, or it's like a finger holding the line in the earphone speaker system. So the signal is not able to transmit to the back, or actually that can happen in the rear part of the brain, which is the occipital loop. In other words, the signal when it stop, it, it can stop there because of the blockage. So I don't care where it is, but Whatever that happened, then create uh, defects in the vision, right? So because, because of that, you can see that, let me look at the other one again. Now, because of that, assume I have, assume I do not correct it. If the eyeball left the way it is, look straight ahead, okay, the axis is the same, it's parallel. So the eyeball looks straight ahead, okay? Then what you see, the object will be defective because you lost part of the vision here. You lost this part of the vision, so that what you see is a smaller image. A smaller image compared to this one, right? This is normal and good eyeball, okay? So you see only that part. But because of the brain is so powerful, it continually tries to adjust the eyeball to a point to optimize the image to a point that is best size that you can find. So what you're gonna do is going to let's see, it's going to turn the eyeball this way an angle, going to turn this way, so that let the image to fall into the good area of the retina, okay? So that now, finally, this image and this image is the same, and this one is definitely is bigger than the one on a defective uh, image. So this is now, he can see full image of what you see in the object. Although, but look at him, he might be not be looking at that person, be looking at the different person on the other side, but actually he's getting his best picture. Okay, so that kind of uh, 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 phenomenon, we call it the cross eye, right? There's a technical, medical name for that, but I forgot that. Um, and then the same applied to the other side. If this damage is on the inner side of the retina, on the inner side, then the eyeball will turn outside with a degree this way to let the image fall into the good side. 
Okay, so it become lazy eye then, okay? Now later on I'll have some picture of those children with this kind of problem and how I'll be able to correct it into a normal eye again, okay? So because the automatic control function in the brain uh, is able to correct it to get the optimal view of the object and then as a result you see a cross eye. Okay, so this is what happened. Okay, you see this eyeball looking inward. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, now that is a very uh, extra special case of automatic control, but the, the brain is consists of many different kinds of hundreds of different automatic control loop that let the body to perform to the optimal, uh, maximal capacity. Okay, and that's the power of our brain. And well, we'll talk about in detail later on. Okay, so uh, let's continue on about the brain now. The brain is continue, uh, composed, consists of gray matter and white matter in the cerebral cortex. So those two areas in a, a, a little different in function. The white matter, actually normally the axon, will go into the white matter to, con to transmit the uh, motion control of the body. Okay, after the decision is made, so the, <coughs> the decision will be transmitted from the axon. <coughs> Oh, this is an axon right here, okay? So all these branches, uh, we call dendrites, <coughs> will be actually connecting with each other to perform calculation or actually decision making uh, or pulling data out from memory bank, or whatever, to make a final decisions. Okay, so this network actually is inside the gray matter, um, the cortex, okay, cerebral cortex inside. And then this inside material primarily they're composed of a lot of particles. These particles, as the medical uh, books will talk about, have a lot of iron in it. Okay, so you see this plus dot, the yellow dot, the yellow dot and the plus sign, this is the iron uh, distributed across the brain evenly. Okay, so this is the Fe iron. If Fe is represented ferrite or ferrous iron, iron, I-O-N, okay. So this is one of the transmitting media for the brain signals. Why? Because we're talking about electromagnetic waves now. So all electric signal will transform into magnetic energy and that will propagate as you go along like electrical energy into magnetic, magnetic into electrical and then so forth, keep moving on. So because of that, the signal is able to propagate in the speed close to the speed of light, maybe not as fast, but it's very fast, just like radio waves. So, uh, but that media that is using is ferrous iron. And that's why I try to point out the importance of my analogy, my, my, my uh, uh, theory, you know, the blood clot is so important. Now, let's talk about blood clots. The blood clots is right here, these big ones. Now, although these blood clots can be as big as the whole page or even bigger than that, now assume this is a very minute one right now. Okay, they all spread inside the network. Uh, some of them may be touching or pressing on the nerve. Some of them may be in the space in between the dendrites, but they have concentrated particles of ferrous iron inside. Because of that interference of the concentrated particles of ferrous iron, it will deflect the magnetic waves and affect the signal transmission. It can actually split one signal into 10 or more different signals at a weaker amplitude. Or we can completely block off the signal totally so that it will not be transmitted at all. So that can happen depending the location of the blood clot uh, formation, the location of the blood clot, or the sizes of the blood clot. Now, assume this blood clot is so big that it really grabbed the whole area. Okay, the whole area now grabbed by one blood clot. So what happened? all that signals inside that area will not be able to function properly. It simply stopped. It simply stopped transmitting. It stopped receiving signals. It's so much magnetic you know, um, particle inside that is beyond the normal operation. So that also become a problem. The brain function of that part will be totally disabled, okay, or incapacitated, totally. Okay, so this is very important part of my theory you know, start with. Okay, so hope that is, is uh, clear to you. Now, so, so far we talk about, uh, I'm talking a lot about the uh, principle and, and how the treatment. Later on I'm talking about how to deal with 
you know, how do I do that with Chinese medicine, okay? But first of all, I want to talk about all these theories that we know, you know, based on that, we come up with a solution for that. Now let's expand that into further. Let's say we talk about one blood clot. Now, actually, in this kind of children there, oftentimes they have uh, some problem, like twitching. Twitching of the muscle in the face, uh, the eyelids, a certain muscle twitching. It's a little small, you know, movement, not the facial movements, okay? And also, when it comes to bigger moment, movement, it can be as big as turning your head like this involuntarily. You sometimes go to a bus station or go to uh, riding a bus, you see some people start moving their hand involuntarily like this or the head like this. You look at him, it seems like you're doing some funny thing, but it's not. He don't know what's happening. It's involuntary, okay? This is a magnitude bigger than normal twitching. It's involuntary motion. Now, what causes that, okay? You understand? The, this, I have two points here. One is through the heartbeats. One is through the electrical pulses initiated through thoughts. Those two will create that phenomena. Now for the uh, big motions, if it's getting real big, the signal all messed up, that can be even worse. That's called epileptic seizure. Okay, it's the same cause, but in a much more complicated form, more defective signal to a point that it created twisting of an arm, you know, turning the eyeball upwards and uh, lost control, things like that. So this twitching can be expanded into epileptic uh, seizure problem. So let's look at the very simple one. Let's look at the blood clot. We have one right now that's pressing onto the blood vessel, okay? Now, um, do you know how the blood flow inside the body? Do you think that it's flowing continuously around from the heart to every, every part of the body? Wrong, it's not. The blood is not flowing in this continuous manner. The blood flows in an incremental manner. It goes this way, in, up, or down, this way. Incremental. Why? Because the heart is pumping one at a time. When it pumps, it goes up. It pumps again, it goes up. And then the, vessel, the blood vessel have a lock to prevent the blood go backwards. Have a, have a lock inside the blood vessel muscle to do that. So now we are seeing an incremental force that's a created, actually initiated by the heartbeat. Okay, right here, I see the pump, like this, incremental, incremental, okay? So by analyzing this signal, you're going to see, uh, 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 by applying Pythagoras theory, you see that A equal to the square root of C squared minus B squared, so you have a component force. From this direction and going to this direction, which is tangential or perpendicular to the surface of the blood vessel. Now that become a kinetic energy. Is the energy be able to transform and transmit it through this hard, solid blood clot? And just like a billet, when you're playing billet, you see the ball hit another ball, and the ball will transfer and then, and move to the other direction or straight forward. Now this signal is also transformed into an uh, electrical pulse through some kind of transducer. Now, some point in this theory, I have to apply the fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is something you fit into the whole picture. You know the input, you know the output, but inside, however they do it, you might have little, uh, you know, uncertainty, but I call that fuzzy logic. It applies to it, and it, it transforms the kinetic energy into electrical energy, and this will become an impulse. The impulse will transmit through the nerve, you know, into the neuron, and then from that, you also transmit into different places and make the, to make decisions, uh, whatever need to be done. So once you know that's not go to one place, you go to all different places, and then you make a decision. So you can see one little input from the heartbeat will be transformed into a kinetic energy that can generate a lot of signals. Okay, although the signal could be very small. But those hundreds of signals sometimes can be magnified because of the blood clot I talked about earlier because of the concentration of the uh, ferrous iron. So because of that, it got amplified. So you see all the people have with hyperactivity, and that is the main reason behind it. So in order to clear the problem, you have to get rid of the blood clot, okay? So, and the twitching uh, is mainly because of that. Uh, another thing is, if you have, think about something, you initiate it inside the neuron with a pulse, and that also can be transmitted through the same way and also through blockage as well. So by thinking, sometimes you can trigger a lot of things that is not what you want. So that's why the kid is so hyper and uh, is not controllable. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that is how that one blood clot affects the neuron system. Imagine that we have hundreds of thousands of those blood clots inside your brain. This blood clot could be in the size of nano nanometer, uh, very, very tiny micron, you know, nanometer dimension, but it can affect the brain functions quite extensively, okay? So let's talk about how to get rid of that, okay? So if I can get rid of all these blood clots, I will restore the brain to the original brain and everything is back to normal by applying the fuzzy logic. Whatever you do normally, you can, achieve, you can you know, get it back, okay? So assume now we have a blood vessel being pressed on by one of the uh, uh, big, uh, bigger uh, blood clots and there are some around it, okay? And then by using a two-way diffusion method, which is normal physical phenomena inside our body systems. And uh, the medication, the Chinese herbal medicine, will go through, actually apply to Western medicine as well, because any medicine will be able to transmit, actually diffuse out and then diffuse back in. Now, by doing that, you'll be able, by using the Chinese herb that I use, I can actually make it soften up and make it into gelatin form. And then it will strip it off a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Eventually, we dissolve the whole thing. After it dissolves, it goes back into the bloodstream through the membrane. Okay, and then be carried out into the kidney and be uh, eliminated in urine. Okay, now try to ex understand it further. Uh, look at that blood vessels here. I assume this is a blood vessel membrane, a little section of it. This is inside, this size inside the blood vessel. This is outside the blood vessel, okay? So because of the membrane are porous, okay, so uh, the medication and some of the blood can actually pass through those pores and go outside, and then with the medication mixed with the blood clot, it can dissolve it. And along with the excessive ferrous iron, it will carry it out to the bloodstream and bring it out. <clears throat> and then eventually, and give it time, and this thing will completely dissolve, and the blood vessel will be restored to just ordinary, flat, you know, normal, normal shape of blood vessels. Okay, so this is one thing. Now, I want to use that, and then we'll talk about how to, uh, let's see, any more, that's it. Okay, what about the time? It's about time for a break now. Or? Okay, maybe it's time for a break because the next session I'll be talking about how to apply Chinese medicine and to solve this problem. Okay. We'll uh, re re rejoin in about 15 minutes, so we have some refreshments and drinks outside. So if you guys want to go outside for a little refreshment, we'll do that in about 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Because you mentioned about the. the
Okay, now we're going to start with the main subject. How to treat this autism problem with Chinese medicine? Uh, we talk about the causes, we talk about the uh, symptoms, we talk about the Western way of treatment, the way how they do it by using diet control, by using, um, you know, like uh, using the killing the uh, bacteria method, um, and also by using key chelation process to get rid of the heavy metals. I didn't go into detail about the chelation, but that's uh, one process. They use a chemical agent to get into the bloodstream to bind, to bind with the heavy metal and come out as a product in the urine. Now that could be very dangerous as well, and I'm sure you read about the article. A child died of that um, about uh, not a year or nine months ago, something like that. So that can be dangerous. They use the KIMAC or the DMSA type of to do that. Uh, and also they recommend uh, using a sauna method by using that to get rid of the uh, toxin through sweat artificially by using other uh, equipment. Okay, so now we start with a new page. How to do it in Chinese medicine. Before I talk about the detail, how, do I, how, how I do it, I would like to briefly cover the basic concepts in Chinese medicine, um, the difference in, in Western medicine, okay? I'm sure most of you know about a little bit of it. And I'd like to be a little more detailed about certain area. For example, in the Chinese medicine, we talked about the brain free earlier, that's like using a uh, scientific model. But there's one thing I cannot present to you, is the meridian systems. In Chinese medicine, is one of the important part of the, um, the body, is meridian system. Jing Luo, Jing Luo, Hai Tong. 12 meridians, the major 12 meridians, um, and also many others that actually cover the whole part of the body, from toes to the head, and every part of the body is being connected in this network. In Western medicine, they don't see that. So that doesn't exist. See, in Western medicine, they look at the things, they see it, it's there. You don't see it, it's not there. But is that really the case in the world? No. I'm sure every one of you have religion. Do you see your God? Does it exist? Do you see, ever see them? No, but it exists, right? So there are a lot of things that actually is beyond our, our scope, you know, as far as that is concerned. So we have to understand that. In Chinese medicine, there's been the history going back about uh, four or five thousand years ago. Uh, start with Nong Dai Noi King, okay? Wang Di Nei Jing. Okay, you talk about a lot about the yin yang, which is the male and female, positive, negative, and all the opposites, you know, it's parity. Now, if you are familiar with the Einstein theory, they talk about parity, right? Xiang Dui Lun, parity, which is a very high form of physics. And uh, Einstein has been talked about uh, as a crazy person until his parity is being proven by a number of scientists. So the parity is yin yang, okay? Positive, negative. It's all parity. In fact, the whole world is parity. Husband and wife, positive, negative, male, female, okay? So in the Chinese medicine, it's the basic concept. The fundamentals is using that, okay? And then from that, it bent into much more uh, uh, elaborate systems, okay? So the um, meridian system is what connected all the organs, the brain, together. If you look at computer system, going back in the uh, 70s, there's a single chip computer, single board computer. You heard about that, right? There's no disk drive there, there's no memory, it's just a single board computer. And then now we have a network. Computer system that do not have a network is a very low function computer. Like the 70s, 60s, you know, at the 60s, they have a the little board that do a very simple thing. Western medicine still have not have a network to connect the whole body together. Yet, not as of today. They don't see it. Open up the body, you don't see it. It collapses. The meridian collapses as you open it up. So it does not exist. But when it's normal body, it actually functions. You know, it's a network to connect the whole body together and be able to communicate from one part of the body to another part of the body. And also the brain, particularly, is the center of the meridian in the head. 
And that's why it's so important that make sure all the meridian is, is clear, it's not being blocked, okay? And that's one of the important part uh, that we have to accept this theory first. Now, this meridian system has been proven in acupuncture, in many ways of Chinese traditional medicine treatment. Um, it's proven. Uh, you can see the results. You know, you can perform full body anesthesia by using acupuncture um, uh, without using anesthesia. Uh, it, just acupuncture alone. Although it's scary, though, when you open your eye and see everybody doing the back and, or, or the uh, stomach, you know. So, but it can be done. It can be done going back to the 60s. You know, I've seen movies of that by using acupuncture. So the meridian actually control all these signals in the brain, can suppress the pain, can actually increase the hormone secretion. It can actually, um, you know, like uh, the balance of the body, uh, how to have the proper functions, uh, supplies, hormone supply, things like that. So it's a very high level of control of your body is from the brain. I developed this brain theory in addition to what I show in this paper. Actually, if you can go to the brain, you know, and restore the original brain function or brain uh, configuration, which, which means that where there's no blockage. When the baby is first born, everything is clear. The blood vessel is clear. There's no cholesterol. There's no triglyceride. There's no plaque. Everything is brand new. The blood vessel is going through the whole body. Blood is reaching out to every cell in the body. If I can do that, I can restore the body back into the function we're supposed to be. So that is the power I'm trying to do by using Chinese medicine, okay? So um, we talk about qi in Chinese medicine. Qi is the energy that flows inside your body all the, all the times. And on a certain time of the day, then you, the qi reaches a certain point. Which part of the day the qi is, you know, is more concentrated in the liver and, and so forth, you know, is all changed according to the time of the day. It's so profound that it's really hard to prove you know, by using the microscope, things like that. But again, like I said, there are a lot of things is beyond our eye can see and it exists, okay? And the way I do things, uh, if you treat a lot of disease in Hong Kong, it varies from diabetic, uh, 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 you know, really um, uh, foot have to be amputated. I can save that leg. I can treat the cancer, you know, from really the terminal stage and back to normal. Um, all kinds of things can happen if you know how to get this system back to normal. But it's not just like one or two pills can do that. Now, in Chinese medicine, we concentrate on whole body treatment. We don't look at one part of the body. We look at the whole body. When you have a problem with your eye, we not just treat your eye, we treat your liver. When you have a problem with your spine, we treat your kidney. When you have a problem with your nose, allergy, we treat your lung and the kidney. So you see, that is the kind of treatment that we have. It's a lot more profound than Western medicine. You have a nose problem, you work on your nose. You spray something there, okay? Or you have a pain in your finger, do something. Or you have a foot that should deteriorate, deteriorate to a point that it has no uh, nerve, is rotten, and uh, having granular, cut it off, okay? If they cannot get rid of the problem, they cut it off and remove it. It's called technical um, type of work. It's, uh, uh, surgical work, and it's not cure. And I have treated many diabetic foot that lost feelings, and they actually start rotting. You see, uh, it become you know numb, totally numb. And the Western doctor recommend amputation, and to um, you know, keep it um, healthier. But they are able to restore that, let it grow with new flesh, come back with sensation, the nerve totally come back. Now that is called treatment of curing of medicine, okay? It's not just removal and um, uh, technology. So, so when I'm talking about that, we talk about whole body. So earlier I talked about a lot of symptoms of those autistic children. I mean, you try to put in, take down some notes, you see that it's over 10 or more of these kind of symptoms that are related to the body functions, like constipation, okay, related to your kidney, fun your kidney function as well as your brain function, and then your uh, skin problem related to your liver function, okay, and uh, also the, um, uh, the slow growth or actually small bone structures, it related to your kidney function also. So all these things, if you know exactly what the cause based on the principles our ancestors and those theory, apply them, you can help them, okay? 
So by looking at all these symptoms, you see there are a lot of different kinds of deterioration inside the organs that cause that. It's not one reason. It's a many, many different kind of compounded problem that become one big problem. And then, you know, that's the scary part of the autism. It's a very complex disease. It's very hard to treat. Okay, so um, well, as you know, that one of the important part of the body is qi. Without qi, the body will stop. Now, in the Western medicine, they don't talk about that. They talk about blood. Now, of course, we also have blood in our system. The blood is belong to yin, the negative part of the body. The qi is the yang, the positive side, the male side of the body. So in order to have a healthy body, you've got to restore and truly to maintain the proper qi path, which primarily is the path of the meridian okay, that flow inside your body. If certain part is blocked, the qi will stop there. If the qi stops there, the blood will not flow to that area. So in order to get the blood flow back to normal, you got to open up the path and let the qi flow through. Okay? So you can see that when a person tries to uh, actually have blood, losing blood, he can survive even though losing a lot of blood for a long time. Because let's say, you know, some people try to suicide, they cut the wrist. That's a stupid way of suicide. Why? Because that blood vessel will close up again. The blood will stop. <laughs> and then, you know, it will not die. That's the best way to advertising ourselves or something, as a star or something. So, but on the contrary, you close up the nose for a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes, and that light will stop. And that's how powerful qi is. You cannot, I mean, you can sub sustain a life by losing a lot of blood, but you cannot support the life if you stop having qi or air breathing in. That's how, how important that qi is. And yet, in the Western medicine, the qi is not entering into picture at all. So they're missing the most important part of the body functions and the meridians the network inside the body. So in Chinese medicine, the medicine have a complete and thorough theory of a body, the signal transmission, how to control, uh, to make sure they get the proper balance of hormone and nutrition and so forth. And so we treat the, when we treat this uh, autism, I use the same principle, it's the whole body treatment. It's not just one part. It's, that's why it makes it so difficult. Okay, so, now, in Chinese medicine, we have actually six uh, major criteria of the body that cause a disease or imbalances of the body. Okay, it's cold, wind, uh, like Han Liang Su, Shi, Cao, Re. Actually, six different characters, the wind, the cold, and chill, and uh, fire, and also uh, very, um, um, it's, it's hard to sometimes say that in English, Cao, uh, very dry and hot. Okay, so this, whenever the body is maintaining a balance of that, you are healthy. But when you're losing the balance or having one side more than the other, then you will, you're going to have problem, okay, or uh, illness will start. So that you have to be constantly maintaining to be a balance, to have a healthy body, okay. So we have herbs actually can really match up to all these imbalances. When you have a very hot symptom, uh, okay, very hot symptom, then you use some drug which is in the cold category to balance it out. Or when you have wind, wind actually, if you try to explain it uh, in, in Mandarin, it's feng, uh, feng. what is wind inside the body? Uh, well, actually, by all these years study, I know what feng means is blockage in your system, blockage in your meridian system, blockages in your blood vessel systems. That is the equivalent word of blockages of your system. So when people have headache, they say you're very heavy on wind. Okay, but what it is is the blockages of blood you know, inside your brain. In Chinese medicine, whenever there's a blockage in that area, you're going to have pain. When that is clear, the pain goes away. Okay, so, um, so migraine, for example. A migraine, the main cause of migraine primarily is the same problem, as I said before, blood clot. For those people who have serious migraine, normally they have impact on the head, they must have some kind of uh, injury in the head. And as later time, they become migraine. Uh, I'm so strong on that because I'm, my result on treating migraines 
100%. What I mean is those serious ones, the ones that have to go to the hospital to live, stay there for one week. When they, the migraine came, you know, they throw up, you know, they really so bad that they have to use a special uh, uh, painkiller, you know, for a whole week. And after that, they still have to stay there for a couple of weeks before they can come out. So that kind of migraine I'm talking about. And I can treat them and make them completely out of migraine, uh, completely cured. So the same thing, blood clot in the head. Whenever there's a blockage, there will be pain. That appears applied to, that applies to the kneecap, joints, everywhere in the body. Whenever you have pain, that part of the body is blocked. The meridian is blocked, and then the blood will be blocked after following that. Okay, so, so these are basic principles, I'm sure, for those who are familiar with Chinese medicine and understand what I'm saying. And, you know, uh, any acupuncture, uh, what they do is try to clear that path, to restore that, you know, clear passage in the meridian so that the pain will go away. So pain, uh, normally acupuncture, you can see that pain uh, reduction very fast. You know, if you run into a good one, you're going to see that immediate pain relief, you know, when that is being, you know, clear. Okay, so now, because of the complexity of this autism problem, so we have to treat almost the whole body. Uh, we have drugs or we have herbs that can help get rid of the, uh, the, uh, the feces you know, every day you know, to eliminate the constipation problem. Uh, we also have um, herbs that can take care of the migraine problem. A lot of times those uh, children that have autism have also headache too. And some can be very serious migraine type of headache because they have blockage in the head. Okay, so in other words, by combining all different kind of uh, herbal functions, you can actually use that to clear all these blockages and strengthen the kidney, strengthen the liver, and also by using certain kind of herb to cleanse the toxin inside your liver. And once the toxin is being cleaned, and also the, uh, the, uh, the constipation problem being eliminated, the toxin entering into your body will be totally reduced. When those toxins reduce, then it will not go into the brain anymore. So first, we want to stop from going into the brain. The second is to how to take it out of the brain that actually uh, accumulated through the years. Okay, so the two things we have to do. One is to stop uh, further um, problem because of the toxin entering into the system. Second, take it out. Okay, so now we have a lot of herbs actually can dissolve blood. We have herbs can actually take out the toxin from the body. Um, and we have also herbs to make the urination more. And uh, we also have herbs to make the constipation go away. So actually, if you can diagnose the person or the child, then what kind of problem they have, and apply the herb accordingly, and you're going to see results. The first thing that I do normally is to make sure the constipation problem goes away first because that is one of the contributing factor of the toxin entering into the brain. So once you see that happen, then the body sometimes you can see that the hyperactivity will slow down. And you see, you see results almost quickly. Sometimes in a week or two, you can see a lot of improvement. Like I said earlier, a child, a that, that that 17-year-old boy cannot say his last name. I can make him talk, uh, say his uh, name you know, very accurately in a week's time. So, and then the visual and audio responses really improve a lot. That he told me, you know, you can hear things much louder and clearer, things and so forth. So, so we treat them one at a time, sometimes all at one time. So depending how the child's um, body, you know, problem, you know, how much they can take. And normally by looking at the progress, you can prescribe. Now, the Chinese medicine is not like Western medicine. They have a couple of pills, and this is for headache, and, and this is for, for uh, constipation, things like that. It, you know, the prescription is combined with all these herbs together to make it into a complete prescription and tailored to that child's need. You know, that's the way I do it. Um, I, do, I change the prescription every week, weekly basis, based on the changes or improvement or setback of the child. So it's very... Um, detailed type of work. It's not like, a, you know, you look at the, uh, the diagram or look at the ta table and how many gram, milligram of this, I mean, it's not. It's a lot more complicated than that. So you really have to understand the, um, the body functions well and also have to understand the herb characteristic and the nature of the herb. And particularly when they combine together as a big prescription, what will be the side effect? What other effect that might affect the body and the negative side as well as the positive side? So for the past seven years, I've done a lot of research. 
with, on my own body. And also, I notice those changes and I try to improve to a point that I really have good results. A results so good that you can see change in one day, in two days. I can make a dying person alive again. I can make a deaf person to hear. I can make a blind person to see again. In fact, I have a, a patient that uh, was, the, the ear was um, actually cannot hear for three years. And she gone through the repair of the eardrum, everything, and still cannot hear. In two days, she can hear on the, on the deaf side. Now, those things are so impossible. Why I can do that? It's the meridian problem. I break through the blockage, the nerve system come back. The nerve can send, send it receives the signal, okay, but it cannot send it to the brain. So once I clear the blockage, the signal goes right through. She can hear people talk again on the right side. She could not believe it. She's using a cell phone, keep talking. Am I hearing it? Is that what I'm saying? Because it's so unbelievable. It's that after three years of continuous looking for repair or treatment by the Western medicine, it's no result. I can do it in two days, too fast. She could not believe it. And I can do it that quick. In fact, uh, you know, many cases that I did, uh, I, based on this concept, if you are very good at medicine, I'm talking about when you're good at this Chinese medicine, not just ordinary amateur person, somebody got to be very good at, I can achieve such a high level of curing uh, out, uh, 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 results that is totally amazing, it's totally unbelievable. Because of that, for the past seven years of research, I'm having really amazing results with the Chinese, uh, with the autistic children. Well, at the final session, I'll show you some pictures of those children before and after. You know, actually, the facial expression and the eye represent the status of the mind. For a person that is retarded, you can tell by looking at his eye. For a person that is not have any responses or any kind of drooping faces, you know that the number seven facial nerve is not functional. So by looking at the person, you can tell a lot. You don't need any equipment. You know, that's what the Chinese medicine, the first diagnosis is through looking at the patient. And then you ask about the problem, Wang Wen Wen Chie, and you hear about what he said about the voice and what kind of problem he tell you, you know, and then you ask about what kind of problem you have, and then use the feeling of the pulse of the person to see how the meridian, the heartbeat, you know, the heartbeat is not just based on BPM. The heartbeat have hundreds of different kinds of heartbeats that you have to know. There are some that tells you the problem with the heart, but some tells you what the blockage in the system. By feeling that pulse, you can tell a lot of things. Okay, but it's a very profound type of diagnosis, okay? Um, but this is the four major diagnosis criteria for Chinese medicine or any Chinese medical doctor. Look at the color of the face, complexion, the eye. So in a second, you're gonna see those pictures. You can tell the difference, really, day and night difference after the treatment, and you see a normal person face again. Um, so actually, <coughs> you know, I cannot tell you exactly what herb will do this job. There's no one herb or two herbs can do this job. My prescription is so big that you won't believe it. How big? Just to give you some reference, in the olden days, in the Chinese emperor's uh, medical record history, you know, the biggest prescription for those doctors that treat emperor is about 50 combinations. That's already very big, okay, 50. My prescription went up to over 200 species, 200 species. It's so powerful that, you know, you have not really with the patient, I would not prescribe. That's why I require my patient be able, let me see them, you know, after taking herb, things like that, because the, the, the reaction is so vigorous and really you see the results so fast, that is unbelievable, okay? I can make person walk again you know, in less than one week, even they have stroke. <clears throat> if they have stroke within about two, three weeks time, paralyzed one side, I can make them walk in one week, or at least the most three weeks time, okay? Recently, I have a patient that has so much pain in the half side from the waist down, so painful, she cannot walk in seven months. I make her walk in five weeks, and the pain is decreased to less than 90%, uh, less than 10%, okay? So, that's, those things happen, it's unbelievable, because that lady has seen all kinds of doctors, psychiatry, pain experts, and, and all the um, doctors that are experts in this field, and no, no cure, I can, and in such short time. 
Okay, so, so this is, a, I'm not trying to brag about myself. I just want to let you know about the work I do is get to such a level that you really have to see it to believe it. It's, uh, and that is not all my work. It's all through the accumulation and compilation of my ancestor, my father's work, as well as the, all these known Chinese doctors going back in thousands of years ago. And I look at their writings, I study them very thoroughly, I experiment with them, uh, with the prescription, and with my own body. And I can achieve to this point that I can say Chinese herbal medicine will be the medicine in the world in the future. And I hope I can make that successful if I have enough chance, enough time to do it. Today, the reason I perform this uh, seminar, really I want to let you as, um, you know, uh, I mean, to know about firsthand. As time goes on, you're going to see me result getting more and more. And then every one of you, you can tell the world and try to really make Chinese medicine, you know, put more energy, more effort, more funding into that and make it into uh, more effective and you know, for the world. That's my goal, but this is not the main reason for that, of course. Okay, so everything I did is unbelievable. I can only say that. You're going to see that in pictures, okay? In fact, Recently, in fact today, for the past few days, I've been very happy. Why? I'm able to help a two years old baby that actually has been on respiratory machine, you know, and their, their doctors in Stanford is totally impossible as far as helping her to get rid of the machine. And they, in fact, even suggest to pull the plug. I'm able to help that little, little girl to get rid of the machine in less than 10 minutes. And since Tuesday, was it Tuesday? Or I think, um, I forgot exactly, a few days ago. And since Tuesday, I think until now, it's been three days now. No, three days, I think. She has been off the machine and breathing normally. And the motion of the leg is start moving, which never moved, the left leg never moved before, is start moving. The 10 minutes, what I did, I used in the Chinese way, traditional Chinese way, to give qi to the, lady, to the girl. And using my herb, because I have no herb here, so my herb is a special herb. My herb is, <laughs> let me tell you what it is, is to how to maintain youth. I use it every day. Today I'm 65. I'm able to talk for hours. I'm able to perform just like a young man because I'm able to make my age go backwards. Chinese medicine can do that. By using that medicine on her, she is now able to restore normal functions of breathing and a little motion on the hand, things like that. That made me very happy. And the herb already on the way, you know, probably should receive it by today and tomorrow from Hong Kong. In the meantime, that little girl is using my herb to help her to get rid of that life-supporting system. In fact, the doctors say even having that system, it might, she might stop breathing any time. And there are a lot of those child in this area, if you try to explore that. And I'm able to do that and repeatedly. I have, I have uh, helped another two in Hong Kong, but here is the first child I've helped. And uh, anyway, and I also have, uh, have an 80-year-old woman that um, have multiple cancers, you know, from uh, ovary cancer, ovarian cancer, and then it is spread into uh, uh, colon and also the liver and the lung and is actually in UC San Francisco. And uh, she only had about two, two weeks life. She already um, you know, on the morphine, on respiratory with oxygen supply, it's half in coma, and the whole body is swollen up, you know, just the terminal stage of cancer. I'm able to get rid of all that water in the, the excise in the stomach, the lung, you know, uh, on the, uh, the uh, there are two tubes actually drain those uh, uh, water retained in the lung. Every day, she had about 700 cc per, per side. In three days, I'm able to get rid of those tubes. It's dried up. And then the waist is from 31 inches down, 38 inches down to 28 inches in less than three weeks. And the leg is completely, you know, get rid of the water and able to see the blood vessel. And then at the end of the third week, she took a plane to Hong Kong to continue treatment. And that's unbelievable. There are four doctors in UCSF just ask the patient's family, what kind of herb they use? Said, There's no one herb. It's a combination of herb that tailored to that particular person. I pour it out of that row, just like that. And herb 
Yeah, herb, not tea, herb, medicine. <laughs> See, the Chinese medicine have been downgraded so much, they don't call that medicine anymore. I can practice here, use my Chinese medicine, because they don't consider it as medicine. They consider it as tea, like you say, and health food, you know. I can treat those dying patients. I can make the person, you know, back to life again. What do you call that? You don't call that tea, don't you? You call it medicine, right? You call it medicine. It's called. It's not tea, it's medicine. Make sure you use the right word. If you don't use the right word, all the Chinese medicine become is not medical anymore. It's ordinary food supply, health food. That's bad. That's not what's supposed to be. I always say to people, you come to see me, you're taking Chinese medicine, herbal medicine, okay, which I can do so much that the Western medicine cannot do. Okay? The Western medicine trying to extract the Chinese medicine to make it into Western medicine. They never succeed very well. Why? They don't know how to combine them into prescription. It's a very complicated process. You understand the nature, who is the master of the herb, who's the, su who's the supplement, who's assigned to go to where? It direct into the 12 meridian. Each one go to a different meridian. It's a very hard to learn. It's not an easy process. Okay? Even you know about that, you still have to have a lot of you know, imaginative power to put them together to fit that particular person at that time. Okay, so anyway, so this is the way the Chinese medicine works. That's how I practice, how I do it. It's, it, it you know, you may ask, what kind of herb do you use? I tell you, if my herb composition made out of 200 or more species, even I tell you, it's not going to help you anything. For example, there are some for dissolving blood, some for getting rid of the you know, constipation problem, some to strengthen your kidney so that you have more energy. Oh, there's one thing I want to, want to talk about. When the herb was being taken, you're going to see one big effect. The body energy will go up to a very you know, big degree, a large degree, to a point that the whole body circulation will increase. The heartbeat will really beat up. And also the blood vessel will increase and swollen. By doing that, you increase the pore size. The pores, since when it's increased, the medication is able to penetrate and go through the pores and be able to dissolve the blood clot and then take it out and then go back through diffusion and carry it out of the system through urine. So that is one thing you're going to see. Uh, minutes after you take the herb, within about 15 minutes, you're going to see the energy flow through the whole body. You know, particularly going to the problem area, you see the face become red, you're going to see the herb go to the head. I mean, you can feel all that happening after you take it a matter of minutes, you're going to see that function start working, okay, and so fast. So, um, so it's a very uh, uh, powerful process that is different than ordinary Chinese medicine prescription can do. And so this is one big uh, step, you know, I think, uh, moving forward or breakthrough in this field. And I really hope that through my work, I'm able to add one page in the Chinese medicine to make it more powerful, to make it more you know, I mean, since the effects faster than the normal people say they're all slow. No, it's not slow. I can save a person in, in one or two days and bring him back alive again. I can do that. So this is um, uh, what, well, basically that's how to treat this disease, okay? So my results are very good. I'm going to show you some picture of my um, patients and then how they when they come and then after a few weeks treatment, how the facial changes, the, the expression, the eye, and all that, okay? And you're going to see that. And then I will, uh, after I finish with that, I also will show you some uh, urine. Uh, I study a lot on urine, okay? Each patient have to bring in the urine for every day. I mean, let me examine them, okay? I will see, you know, all different things. I'm going to talk about that in detail later on. And also, we're going to show you <coughs> the, uh, some of the dead heart cell. Uh, people with you know, serious heart trouble, with myocardial infarction problem, I can make a bad heart good, into a good heart again. Uh, I have a patient, actually a young man, that have a heartbeat of 38 when he comes to see me. I bring him back to normal 75. And through the process, I'm bring, I, can, I can bring out all the dead cells from the heart, you know, and restore it and regenerate new cells and back to the new, uh, like a new heart. And also same thing on the liver, I can bring out all the dead liver cells, which actually, you know, a formation of cancer. I can do that and then let it grow new cells. Okay, all that's going to happen in my, the urine I'm going to show you in a second. So um, the company in Hong Kong I named as Regeneration Company Limited. In other words, what I'm trying to say is I can regenerate the body 
you know, the organs to a point that, you know, you res I mean, restore your health. And uh, that can be done, you know, through this process of um, urine that examination, you're going to see that. Um, <clears throat> And I think uh, you're going to see crystal comes out from your kidney, the kidney stone problem. You can get rid of all that. I can restore an uh, 80-year-old man's sex function, just like a young man again. Don't laugh. This is very important for men, okay? <laughs> oh, they try everything. Even though they're a millionaire, you know, they can have a lot of money, but they cannot have that. So that I can do, you know. So you look me, you know, like a 65 years old man, I'm going through all this regeneration uh, process by taking herbs, okay? And then, like I said, you look at me, my hair is still black, and I stand up straight back, and I can walk and talk like a young man. How I can do it? Chinese medicine. The highest form of Chinese medicine is to restore, actually maintain the youth of a person. Now I can even go back in age. Actually, people who know me seven years ago, they said, I look younger than seven years ago. OK, so that is true, because the way I do things. You know, in Hong Kong, daytime I practice medicine. Start at 8 o'clock, I go to dancing. Every night, three, four hours a night, ballroom dancing, every night. So you can see that requires a lot of energy. And, um, and, and that is, you know, it's not easy. So if I can do that, that means I can bring the sick person back to normal again by using the same principle, right? So um, anyway, so much for that. I'm now going to start with the um, picture demonstration. OK. First of all, I'm going to start with facial comparison. As I go along, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the individual child, the problem they have, and so forth. OK, the first, you can see that the left side I present it will be before treatment. And then the next side and the right side will be after. Now, sometimes the treatment we're talking about is only about three weeks, maybe even two weeks, OK? And you're going to see the difference. Look at the eyes. The first one, you know, the eye is just like, um, you know, a sleeping eye or somehow you don't see the concentration of the eye. But look at the second one, the smiling faces. The eye, can, you can show the beam, you know, you can see that big difference, okay? Second one, this is a Japanese uh, girl that have autism. That, uh, she actually is not very clear to the parent. She cannot learn English very well. Um, you know, and when I talk to her, I don't understand what she say because uh, it's not quite accurate as far as pronunciation is concerned. And then as her mother told me that uh, going to school, he have a hard time learning. Okay, so that is part of the symptom of uh, autism. Okay, and also she have a lot of rash, and um, that's another symptom of autism. And uh, very active after taking herb. Now this one is a little bit long. Look at that June fifth. Uh, and then to September 14. So you talk about maybe June's about three months' time. You look at the eye, look at the face. Now, for those children that have autism, the number seven nerve, you know, facial uh, nerve, they're very dull. They do not have the strength to pull up. So normally they don't smile. Oh, and in fact, I call it open mouth syndrome. So they see, you see the mouth is kind of droop open, and they don't have that kind of, of force to pull them up. But after that, you see the smile. Now, when I take picture, I do not ask the child to smile for me. I simply say, I'm going to take a picture now. OK, ready? I'll take it. Now, I will just see how the facial expression and reflects her mental condition. So this is not for me that asking this, her to smile. It's natural. OK, so each and every one of them, I do that. OK, now this is uh, from the United States. And uh, he spent about three weeks with me. October 5th and then October 23rd is the last one you know, the, the, and then went back to the United States. <clears throat> Through this a few weeks' time, he had uh, remarkable changes as far as speech is concerned, uh, say things more clearly, able to say the whole sentence instead of a couple of words. And look at the eye, and he had the um, open mouth syndrome. Okay, it's very common for those children. They don't close their mouth because the facial nerve doesn't have the pulling force for it. Okay, and look at the eye. Um, you know, after that, you see only a few weeks, you see the difference. Now, this one is very serious, severe autism. He had uh, abusive, self-abusive uh, type of action. He hit himself all the time. Look at the right chin, the cheekbone is swollen because he's continuously hitting himself. And he uses his finger to scratch his own nose all the time. 
and sometimes step on his own, uh, his own hand. But when he 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 crouches down and step on his own hand, but he don't feel any pain. Okay, so um, you can see that after uh, a short time, you know, from October 30 to November 10, you see it's only a few days. You see the changes, amazing. Uh, the hitting, uh, self-abusive action have slowed down quite a bit. Um, he's able to face the camera and have a good smiling eye. Uh, this is, uh, like I said, I try to emphasize, emphasize one thing. The facial expression and the eye, the look of the eye, reflect the mental condition, okay? So you can see, autistic child normally you can see that very easily by looking at how they look. Uh, this one is in Hong Kong, from Hong Kong. And uh, he has so much problem that uh, his father is, a, is an attorney. Both of the parents are attorney, so they consider they have good genes. But they, they have two child, they have problem. Okay, this is one of them. But they never, he never accept that. So he always thought that his child is hyperactive. It's just the character of the person. And uh, even at the time that he uh, was uh, uh, referred to me, he waited about six months before he sent his child to let me uh, treat him. Now the major problem he had is he cannot stand still. He cannot maintain the balance when he walk. And when he play balls, like a, you know, a football, he always you know, try to catch the ball after the ball is in the, uh, uh, what do you call that, long moon. Uh, in, uh, in that, uh, how do you call that? Go. Go, yeah, the go, okay, right. Okay, he's always about a minute late. When you see the ball in there, he's going to catch it, okay? So that means, you know, the visual response from decision making is delayed by at least a minute. So you see how the clock rate, we call it clock rate in computer, is very slow, okay? So, you know, I mean, this, everyone was laughing at him, the, 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 the peers, you know, kind of always laughing at him based on that. And then finally, after treatment for about six months, he's able to play ping pong and be able to match with other uh, peers, okay? The ping pong is a good, uh, measurement of his responses because when you see something, he always, you know, you know, try to get the ball after the ball is outside of the table. But now, at the time at the end, you know, he's able to do that normally and he stand still. He can stand on one foot, so it's big improvement. And then he smile. Look at the picture. He smile very good too. Okay, uh, and then on all, oh, this is a Japanese boy, five years old, five years old. Uh, he's a brother of that. Uh, the girl a little earlier talked about that cannot read well, cannot learn English very well. He cannot talk. Not even one word. Okay, not even one word. So mother have taken him into a different kind of specialist, had take MRIs or whole inch of MRI pictures, you know, try to diagnose the problem from the brain. They cannot find anything wrong with the brain. Very cute boy. You know, very hyper. When he come to my office, he slammed the door. He run up and down, you know, and also uh, try to you know uh, turn around and all kind of movement. You just cannot hold him still. And then I study that. I look at the tongue. If you look at the tongue, you see that it's connected with the tip. So you know, the first day, the first day I talked to the parents, I said maybe that's the cause. He never can stick his tongue out. So because of that, he cannot talk. But actually, it's not the case. One week later, actually look at the date, April 28th. That is May 6th. One week later, I make him stick his tongue out just long as long as a normal person. Although they're still connected here, okay, but he can stick his tongue out. And then, not only that, he can actually start talking. He can have some word come out. Do you know what he say the first word in his life? Not Papa, not Mama. Do you know what he, what he say? No. No. He said, God damn it. <laughs> because through his past five years, he cannot say a word. He must be very frustrated in life because uh, look at all these things. Everyone say and laugh, but he cannot say a word. And suddenly he can find out his tongue can move. He uttered out that word is God damn it because he's so frustrated. You can understand why. So after that, he started learning. Baba, Mama, I love you, all these simple sentences. They really progress tremendously. And he's been with me for almost nine months. And at that time, he's able to go to school. And then the teachers say that he's really working, uh, playing with the peers, with the you know, same AIMS group, and able to participate. Before, he's all by himself, you know, all doing all kinds of destructive things. 
and much calmer. When you have much calmer, the behavior will be normal, and then the attention become much more attention, attentive to anything that you're trying to learn. So that's also called attention disorder, ADHD, and hyperactivity deficiency. So that's a very um, good case that in one week I can make him talk. But not everyone is that good, but this is one of the outstanding cases. This one also have the open mouth syndrome that you can see the nerve is kind of dripping down, just like any stroke patients. Most of them, they have the facial, one side is dripping down. They normally do not smile, they normally do not have any expression, not that they don't want to. They cannot perform that because number seven uh, nerve has been paralyzed. So it cannot have the uh, strength to pull up and perform these different kind of expressions on the face. So after the treatment for I think uh, this is March, March 7 to March, let's see, let's see. This, no, actually it's 03, 2003, July 23rd to uh, uh, August, about a month's time. And then after that, and a year later, she stopped treating again. Actually, she's been treated for a few months and stopped and come back about a year later. Okay, 2004, and, and much better. He, grown, he actually grew about six inch taller. As I said before, you know, when I in, improve the overall, the overall body function, I also increase the growth hormone. Each and every one of those children experience a much faster growth in the height and the body structure. So that means the growth hormone really is coming out in, on each and every one of them. I measure them when they first come and, and then progressive every month I measure them. And some I go up as much as six inch in two years time. And that is very, you know, good growth rate compared to uh, the normal, you know, they're very normal. So you can see how mature they lo uh, she look, you know, on this one, how mature she look. And one day she come to see me, said, Dr. Ao, you know what? I find myself very happy. I never have that before. I always feel very unhappy. I don't know why. See, when the, when the uh, meridian in the brain got cleared, the person will become very happy. And that's exactly why the people with depression, actually for the autistic children, most of them are very, have depressed uh, type of character. Even though they're very young, even they are three years old, four years old, okay, they, they look depressed, okay? Because the signal inside the brain all messed up. They go, you know, in circle. Did not go to the proper pace as they should. Okay, so, you know, she told me he's very happy, okay? And then the mother told me that, you know, recently, you know, after going to school, he's really happy, you know, uh, going to join the, uh, the fans function, things like that. It reflected in, his, uh, in her uh, face. This is not autistic. Uh, this is uh, just so happened to show you the facial expression. She had the cerebellum atrophy, atrophy. There's no cure for her. And then look at the face first come on July 16. And then, you know, about a month and a half later, you can see the facial expression, the nerve come alive again. And it, it, it's not only have a better complexion, but you can see that the smile and all these things happen. You see, it's a two different person. Okay. Now, this one is um, a seven-year-old. And uh, the first one, you can see that the eyes look at me, but it's not looking at me. I don't know what it's looking at at that time. But then after treatment for uh, until in September, you can see the eye is so lively. And um, actually, she, he thinks he sees things much better than he came. In fact, uh, one day when he see me in the, my um, office, and then he look at me and say, "What happened to your neck?" See, I have a white spot in my neck for a long time since I was about 12 or 13 years old. I said, "Didn't you see that?" See, uh, he's a family fan of me in Hong Kong. I mean, United States. And actually, you know, since he's born, he's been seeing me for a long time. You know, actually, on and off. He never knew to notice that my neck had this white spot. Until that day, he started asking me, what happened to your neck? Well, do you put some pain there? No, I said, it's been there for all the time that you're born. So you know one thing, the visual responses improve. The visual ability jump up. You can see more different level of color. Instead of brown or my, my complexion, you can see a little lighter spot, okay? So that is another example of visual improvements when you, after he's taking a certain amount of herb that clear the network out, his nerve is being sharpened. His hearing, oh, in the past, whenever the group people talking, he'll become very impatient. He'll put his hand, you know, like this, shut off from the crowd because it bothers him. 
Because what happened is those sounds or those voices that he heard is not voices. It's actually a garbage because of the transmission or because of the perception after going through the uh, nerve become, you know, scrambled. So what he hear probably is a bunch of noises. So in order to prevent the noise to irritate him, it covers his ear. And that happens quite often in a lot of these children. Okay, so I call that as a closed ear syndrome. Um, and then after the treatment, that go away. And then he can talk much clearer. I can hear he talk a lot, you know, uh, better before. He talks so fast, I don't even know what he's talking. And, uh, and also it's much calmer, more attention when he's learning, uh, uh, when he's study. So this is a big difference. You know, only six months time stay in Hong Kong and sti still continue uh, after that. Okay, this is a one big, uh, uh, big contrast, you know, before after. You know, the open mouth syndrome, you know, and it's all there. It's drooping down and then the eyes doesn't have that contact with people. But after that, you see, almost a year, you know, I said, uh, November 8th uh, is the first day he came and then June, about uh, eight, uh, eight months, and he really become much smarter, able to sing songs and being able to really play with the peers and all that. Big difference on this one. And this is a 19 years old kid that has been, um, you know, go to actually his parents, you know, put him in the special school in England, um, and then the special school for autistic children. And when he first came, you know, he cannot even say A to Z. He cannot continually say that. Um, he cannot say his name. Uh, look at his eyes, a bit dull, open mouth syndrome also. And then after treatment for about eight months, I think, um, yeah, actually he has been staying with me for about eight months. But look at the eye, you see how sharp the eye is? And then the picture, the first picture that before treatment have only two dimensions, okay? The color is really not very vivid. And then you can turn it upside down, you can, it's still the same, okay? So it's no, uh, uh, dimension on that. But they look at the one that he did, you know, um, later. Actually, you know, this is actually with color, much more color, more uh, three-dimension type of picture. Uh, big difference. And then his grandma say that you can perform a lot of little things at home, be able to talk back. Uh, before you can tell him, again, you really scold him, he don't say a word because he don't know what he's talking about. Then now he's able to respond, even though it may not be a very good response, but able to talk back. Uh, I told her there's a good sign. So because he's able to think now, he's able to react now, which is very important for the autistic children's improvement. Okay, this is another one. Look at the eye and the mouth, and the nerve is relaxed, so relaxed that you don't see any expression on the face. He also has eczema around the mouth, and um, after treatment you see all that go away, and the eye become bigger, and look at the eyeball, the, how piercing the eye is, and then you can transmit the thinking through the eye contact and then smiling also. <clears throat> and then this one that I talk about seven years old cannot see color. Now the first picture I took, you see the eye how small it is and how he see me by actually his head was tilting upwards like that. See, a lot of those children, they sometimes look at me this way and that way, this way. They all have different kind of head position to see me. And that means that optical nerve have a problem, see? But after treatment, you can see they can look at me face to face you know, see the eyes much bigger now uh, at that time. In fact, he stayed with me uh, three months, more than three months now. In fact, still under my treatment right now because the parents see continuous improvement through all these years. He is able to participate in all kinds of functions in school. In fact, performing quite well in the scores. You know, I mean, really progressing well. Um, you can see big difference in his uh, face, you know. He's not long, no longer hyperactivity, and he see colors now after three uh, after three months of treatment. He see color, you know, and then that is the person that I said, you know, amazing, that um, in his life before seven before seeing me, is living in a gray world, gray color world, different gray level. And suddenly you see color. If he's not been getting well, how do people know that he don't see color? No one will. So actually, it's like color blind. You know, because you cannot tell the difference between green and red. Okay, so colorblind is one form of autistic problem. It's a symptom of that too. Because you cannot see the different shade of different color. Because it's so weak in the reception, the, the optical reception. Okay, there's another one that is also a, a, a sister of that person. The, the boy have a good eye, uh, piercing eye a little earlier. <clears throat> Look at the um, eye. 
before seeing me, when she go to sleep, it was half, half open. But after treatment, I didn't take the first picture at that time. But then afterwards, about a few months later, his mother, her mother told me that in the past, you know, she had to really put some uh, eyelid, you know, I mean, something to cover her eyes so that it won't be too dry in the, in the morning. But then at that time, still have the slit open. And afterwards, you know, a little later, a month later, completely closed. He can completely go. At that time, ask, him, ask her to close her eye. That's the best you can do. But that one asked her to close and close completely. And look at the eye. Eyeball is, com is bigger than before. It's bigger than before. You see, I mean, the size really uh, looks better. Smarter looking too now. This is the one I want to demonstrate to you about the cross eye problem, lazy eye problem. And then after treatment, I can make that back to close to normal. He they have been with me for five years. That's the twins that have been published in the South China Morning Post. If you try to read that, it'll tell you some story. At that time, it's only been one year. After that, they, both of them have been with me for five years. And then a tremendous improvement from serious migraine headache and to uh, flus every day. They have a room in the hospital that is special for them. So they go in and out of the hospital almost year round. Okay? And, uh, and the time they see me, it was, they were four and a half. Uh, the parents that thought that they cannot pass five. And now they are so healthy and grow so tall now, and they can participate in all sports like swimming and all kinds of things. And they're really um, amazing. And you look at them just like a normal person. Look at the teaming of the eye. Teaming is the eyeball movement. That, see, look at that. You know, you can see the big difference. Okay, look at this. This is now the same position they're looking at. You see both eyes are very close to the same direction now. But then this one, look at this side. Look at that side. See all is away. Okay? And, but now you see how the big difference it is. Okay, so, um, and this one you can go left and then go, go right. And then, you see this big difference. And then another one, the sister, elder sister, maybe a couple minutes uh, born earlier. And look at that one. She look up. This one go this way. When this one is almost close to normal now. And then go to the left, and then go to the right. See, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, look, at, I did not use any lens correction, OK? In the Western world, they use a lens correction, try to force them back to the normal. That's wrong. Why? Because at that time, when they were crossed like that, they see the best image. You try to correct it back that way, you actually see only half the image, maybe. OK? So that's my theory. The automatic control of the brain is so powerful, it's self-correct itself. But by that time, I actually take out a lot of blood clot in the brain, so able to bring the nerve back to normal position, and the retina be able to restore uh, to uh, close to normal, I'm sure close to normal uh, 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 function now. And then sh they, both of them tell me that in the past, sometimes see me without a nose, sometimes see me without a chin, sometimes see my image of two or four different images. That's why sometimes they don't look at me, because it, it's really scary, you know? And then when, in the past, when they draw me some picture, it's very out of proportion. It's very ugly looking. It, look at it, it's just like, um, it's just not good looking, OK? And then after being treated, and they keep giving me pictures and draw me pictures, colorful pictures, well proportions, always wearing a smile. Now, that reflects the, how they feel at the time. Before, it's all very worried and sad faces. And after the treatment, all pictures, I've been keeping all these pictures they draw me. And you see a big difference. And by looking at the picture, you see how the, the mental state or the mind you know, improves, uh, both in, in the feelings, uh, uh, everything okay, reflects in the pictures. OK, this is the 17-year-old uh, uh, boy. After the seminar, I perform in Hong Kong. And the parent, the, the, the mother, the, both of them come to see me. And this boy has very violent and aggressive nature at times so violent that the school would not accept him. Because sometimes, a lot of time when he get angry, he like to choke people, including his mother. Uh, it's so dangerous that the school would not accept him. So he's at home all the time. Um, and then, you know, and he don't want to talk. He don't want to talk. Then the reason why he don't want to talk, I found out later on, is his tongue can only come out about one centimeter. It's so hard for him to take out the tongue. You know, it takes a lot of force and energy to do that. Because of that, he seldom talk. At home, he's just very quiet by himself. One week later, like I said, same thing happened to him. He can stick his tongue out all the way. 
And then since then, he's been talking and talking all the time. Every time he comes to see me, he spends an hour with me, he's doing most of the talking. <laughs> okay? And then his mother is really surprised to see the changes. And look at the eye. The eye tells you easily that that person is a very violent type of person. The eye doesn't look very normal. It's not kind. But look at this eye. It's so mellow. You see, he's no longer, after treatment for about three months, he do not have the violent, aggressive behavior anymore. Even though getting very angry, he's able to control it. So uh, his, her, his mother is so happy. It's been uh, close to 10 months now I've been treating him. And everything is getting so normal. He can even write an essay to, uh, to um, participate in the uh, contest of uh, autistic children contest. He writes very well. The problem he had is he had some kind of distorted feeling about body contact with females. Every time the female teacher touch him, he become very angry and sometimes become very aggressive. And then, and because of that, I keep telling him this is normal nowadays. You know, you can pat, you know, the uh, female teacher's shoulder or even hug them. Hug them. There's no problem. But you just can't accept that. So my wife, when she was with me, always tried to tease him and try to shake hands with him. In the beginning, he just don't want to do that. He's always shy away from that. But now, he's getting to a point, he really enjoyed my wife trying to do that. And he's now slowly rid of this kind of problem now. So um, you can see that you know, each of these persons have their own problem. It's all unique by themselves, OK? So look at the eyes are mellow, how nice looking, you know, boy. Before, uh, his mother told me that you could be having water all over the kitchen. He just walk around without seeing it. He just don't do anything. But now when you see water, he'll go, oh, mom is wet. And he just try to mop the floor on his own initiative. See how different it is? When a person was autistic, he do not aware of what's happening around him. He do not care about what's happening to the environment. He just himself. Everything happened around his own himself. He don't know what's going on around, uh, outside of him. But after treatment, uh, big improvements, one after another, it really happening. OK, this is a three-year-old, probably youngest boy I treated um, before a few days ago. <coughs> before I, I treated two, 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 and, uh, two months. This is three years old. Why the parents know that he's autistic? Because he has a twin brother. The twin brother really progressed so fast. Development is so fast that it can make him just big difference. So the mother have studied all that autistic behavior and actually went to classes and all that. And she knew about all that uh, modern theory or actually the, the, you know, as far as diagnosis is concerned about autistic uh, behavior. So after she heard the seminar, my seminar in Hong Kong, she immediately see me. And the kid has progressed so well that now he can talk about a lot of things. He can talk about a whole sentence like, good morning, Dr. Ao, you know, uh, goodbye. And then uh, sometimes even say the whole thing in sentence. And also the only problem he had right now, he had one difficulty in pronouncing the L sound, which is very common in autistic children. The L sound, uh, like for example, pillow, uh, he say pillow. Okay, yellow, he say yayo. He just cannot put the tongue up. And occasionally, one out of 10 times, he can do that, but not all the time. But the rest of them is very good. I mean, he can able to improve, he's able to participate in the peer uh, with them together in the group functions. And he used to be very scary of height. He cannot ride on his father's shoulder. But after treatment, he's able, in fact, he'll fall of doing that. He ride on his father's shoulder. He's not afraid to have it anymore. And he, when he's in the car, he look around, seeing all, the, all this kind of happening. Before, he's scary. He don't want to look at things. He's just uh, very close uh, himself inside the car. So all that happened tells you that the visual responses as well as the hearing responses has incre uh, improved uh, tremendously. Now, one thing I want to use that example to show you about how difficult it is to improve language. Now, for example, why the 17-year-old boy cannot say his last name after all these therapists? After all this teaching from his parents, can I say it right? One is the hearing sound has been distorted and being scrambled. So what it really hear is not that sound that we, we, we come out. So that makes it hard for them to imitate because they don't know what it is. Okay? So now that is same thing happened to the child. And it takes us a little while to correct all this sound until 
uh, except that L, you still have problem. Now, there's one thing very funny is, he speaks English all the time at home because his parents from United States and also work in Hong Kong and Taiwan. They go to international school. So uh, the international school speak English, so he, all he learned is English, so everything is in English. When he comes to my office, he's speaking English. But recently, um, actually, during the uh, Chinese New Year time, he went back to Taiwan to visit his grandparents, and he learned Mandarin. Now, one thing is very funny, I want to tell you. He had problem in English speaking, but he had no problem in speaking Mandarin. Why? Let me tell you why. When he had the first layer of phonetics being taught when he's young, that laid the foundations of the speech, okay? So that foundation become very hard to erase, okay? You want to change that sound, it's very hard. But for Mandarin, he have no foundation at all, not one word. So when he learned that, it's 100% right. Besides, he had, his hearing has become normal again, so he can say, completely correct. That's amazing. That tells me that and confirm my theory is right, okay? To erase O and then you put a new in takes time. Takes time. That's why sometimes when you go to, well, actually some people from, from Texas or New York, they have the accent, New Yorker or Texas accent. And even they are very old, they still maintain that accent. Why? Because the foundation of the language when they start learning is later the foundation that can never be able to be erased completely. And that's why I always have accent. Just like us, come from Hong Kong, have our own accent that we cannot 100% erase. Okay, so the same thing. So you can see how complex it is. You understand, you know, the, the language is not simple. Talk about one word, for example. Uh, just let's say, um, smile, for example, smile, okay? Now I've been talking very fast right now. Are we out of time? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm really behind. Okay, um, well, let's talk about that. One sound, one word, smile, composed of a lot of information in the data bank. For example, smile, then you have to open up your mouth, and then you can, and then the, the tongue have to perform a certain way, and all these things have a combination of data to control the muscle to come up with that sound. Imagine that I've been talking so fast, you know, how much information I've been pulling out of my data bank? and be able to do it one at a time continuously, and that take a lot of functions, and actually the data retrieval, back and forth, back and forth, to get the word out continuously. So you know how hard it is to correct the speech of autistic children. It takes a lot of time, and that's why. Okay, now let's go a little further, because I'm short of time now. It's, um, so let's move a little faster. This is another boy that cannot say things right, very hyperactivity. After treatment, he's been really, uh, you know, quiet down. This is the sister of the the brother who cannot see color, and when he come to see me, what he wants is, I want to be smarter. I want to get better score in school. And so she did. Why? Because she had problem in visual and audio responses. She cannot see things like we see. It's always dark. So we cannot see things very good, you know, at night time. And then uh, when he's actually listening to the uh, class, you know, the teachers, she cannot hear 100% what she said because of the weak hearing uh, uh, response of her ear. But after that been treated and she become really much more active and much more smarter. Okay, this is the one that came from the United States. Uh, cannot talk. In one week, you see how to change in the facial nerve. The eye was smaller and actually one side of the face is different, you know, is actually smaller than the other side. But this is smaller. But one week later, look at the date, July 3rd. This is June 25th. You see, suddenly it's completely relaxed. You see the eyes back to normal. You know, it's much beautiful looking girl, uh, much better than what it was. And then she still cannot talk as of today, but she is able to stick her tongue out. She's making all kind of funny sounds. She is trying to talk, so which is good. And then besides that, actually, when she come back here, her mother tell me that, told me that um, the school teacher tells her she has been much better than before, much quieter, much more attention. She is able to identify pictures that she cannot before. And all these things happening, and that even though she's not able to talk yet, but the progress is very remarkable. <clears throat> and then there's a lady, 
that actually come to see me in Hong Kong for three weeks, although she have good response improvements, but because of um, the the mother thing, probably is not obvious. So she stopped treatment after three weeks. But you can see the eye changes. The eye tells you the mental state has been improved. It's able to talk back to her grandmother. All these things, actually her relative or something. Um, so that helps improvement. But sometimes the parents or they don't, don't understand how complex this is. And it takes one year to have it uh, uh, treated. Now this is a boy that cannot say his last name. Uh, even he's 17 year old. His last name is Chu. He cannot say that. Although it has been have a lot of therapies to help him, and then the, look at the tongue. Before he can only stick out that much, okay, and then one week later he can stick it all out, and he's able to say his last name accurately. Besides that, if you look at the facial expression, and have a lot more expression in the in the face now, the expression due to number seven nerve and other nerves, you know, getting more activated. And then this is a boy also have good improvement. And uh, when he comes to see me, he cannot answer me about where do you live. He cannot answer me. And afterwards, he can answer. And he have much more, um, he can say the whole sentence and talk a lot before he just cannot do that. And this is another boy that I'm still treating right now after coming back from Hong Kong uh, from the last uh, seminar. And he always look at me with the head uh, twisted this way. And now he's able to look at me straight. And he can have a lot of improvements. I cannot say in detail, but just to show the face. Now this is another one, you see the big difference, and you cannot, when they look at me, you know, he looks like so frowning and so uncomfortable, uncomfortable. But then look at afterwards, in only three weeks, and he's able to look at me in the eye. And this is another one from the United States. I had about uh, 15 uh, family came from the United States back to Hong Kong for treatment. And about, uh, about three actually is continue on the treatment because they realize the improvement where the others think is too slow. This is another one, good improvements too. Uh, look at the face, you see the dif difference in the facial expression. And this is a girl that cannot talk right at the beginning, but now improves a lot and actually uh, uh, much calmer now and able to follow my uh, teaching as far as the uh, sound is concerned. So same thing happened here and there, okay. This is a stroke patient that uh, restores the uh, face uh, um, uh, muscle, uh, so that it's equal. And oh, this eye, look at the eye. This one is looking downward. And this is looking straight forward to me. But after treatment, both eyes is normal now. Same phenomenon like the little twins, OK? So this is end of the face comparison. Now, um, I have some, uh, let me just um, flash through the other thing on the, uh, on the urine sample to give you some idea. I'm short of time now. I still want to leave some time for Q&A. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to show you some of these urine are collected, and after oxidation, it will actually can see the dead cell from the heart, from the liver, and also the crystals, which is the kidney stone from the kidney. Um, and in the blood from the head, uh, also, you know, um, some of those uh, tissues. Let me show you now. Okay, look at the, uh, the top one is the urine collected one week. And then the next one, the bottom one is one week, normally it's one week later after oxidation. So look at the color, the color reflects the blood. Okay, if you look at this one, the orange color, where did it come out? It come out from the heart. Then after one week, all that iron will become oxidized into ferric oxide. The ferric oxide is brown in color, just like rust. Like ferric oxide, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's the color you have. So these are blood from the heart as well, from the head. And from the heart, normally you don't oxidize that fast. But from the head, the iron, iron will come out and oxidize quite quickly. And same thing here, you see the orange color, you see it turn into brown, turn into dark brown, okay? And also you see the same thing. The orange color, the heart trouble problem, and also from the head, you see the brown and dark brown in the bottom. And all these things are actually the blood clot being dissolved and come out of the system. And um, the people have a lot of problems, normally have very dark uh, color. You see that oxidized into brown color. And you see this uh, little um, precipitate in the bottom. This is a heart cell heart cell, from a dead heart cell from the heart. 
If I can bring it out, it will grow new cell that have become improved. Okay, and then after a week, you see oxidized. Some of those blood from the head will be oxidized and become dark, become ferric oxide, Fe3O4. Same thing. You see, this is I've been do, I've been seeing uh, watching urine changes for seven years. From that, I come up with a lot of things that no one knows about. Okay, same thing. You see how dark they are. I try to go a little faster. Now these are healthy. When you get to the final stage, you see they are pretty much unchanged, and that's good. That means most of the blood, the iron ion is carried out, and people, the person normally will restore uh, much much better health then. Okay, same thing, blood color. Now all they come out from the urine. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some heart cell. In the, okay, when the person have a heart trouble, and normally my herb able to go through the heart and bring out the dead cell. The dead cell not only is not helping to pump, it actually become a payload for the heart. So instead of pumping normally, it will not function normally. So it will skip a bit or will miss a bit or try to murmur uh, uh, this kind of and space out unequally, irregular heartbeat, things like that. But after I take it all out, the heart will perform normal again. Like I said, I have a patient that had a 38 heartbeat, you know, BPM 30. I can make it back to normal 75. And uh, the Western doctor recommend him to have a, uh, put in a pacemaker. But actually, I can do that within a few months and bring it back to completely uh, healthy state. Although it will take a long time to back to normal, uh, healthy, uh, like a, a brand new heart. But the person is now able to do sports and all kind of things that like a normal person can do. Look at how the uh, how the blood, the, the, the heart cell is pink in color, and the blood stain, the blood come out from the heart, okay? And look at all that deposit, okay? That oxidized and see chunky stuff. And look at all that blood stain from the heart. And that really died, you know, I mean, stay, become stain in the bottle. And this is very, you know, you've opened the heart of a chicken or something like that, you're gonna see that color. And the blood actually spilled out from the uh, heart. Same thing, heart cell, they look very nice, very pink, okay? But they are not good. If you have that in your heart, and the heart normally is not good. Because the dead cell affect the beating of the heart. Okay, um, then same thing, pink in color, and blood stain. Same thing here too, okay. Now, let's talk about some fat in the fat liver. You heard about fat liver, right? Now, fat liver actually is because of the accumulations of excessive fats in the blood. So that will accumulate and stay in the, in the liver. And the liver will become hardened as it go along because of fatty liver. And then the hardened liver will actually evolve into lungs and tumors and actually can cause cancer. So it's very important to bring it all out. Okay, look, the fats come out. Look at the fats here, just like the chicken soup put in the refrigerator, what it looks like, and that's what it looks like, okay? So all that fat will float on top of the urine. You know, I can bring it out, I can have the liver to grow new cell to fill that place again. So in other words, I can make an old person to young person. Why? Because I can get out all this dead cell, the, the, the brown spot in the face will go away after I do that. Okay, look at all the fats, white. Some is like mildew, but they are all different. They actually, some of them come out with toxin as well. Amazing, isn't it? I can do so much with the, liver, uh, with the urine. And from that I can diagnose, from that I can uh, change the prescription to fit for the best treatment, because I know what kind of problem you have most in the body. Okay. Now the liver cell, okay, for cancer, people like that, you know, you see a lot of those things come out. Okay, the liver color is different. It's brownish, a little like purple color. If you buy a liver, the, the, the pork liver, you're gonna see that. Open it up, you see those kind of color. Cholesterol, one thing you're interested in, the, the plaque inside your blood vessel. If I can get rid of all that cholesterol inside the blood vessel, I can make that person young again because you restore blood supply to every part of your body, all the cell, 
will be able to have fresh blood supply and oxygen supply. So that's why I can make people younger or I can maintain myself to be young because I'm able to get rid of all that cholesterol. These are cholesterol from the blood vessel, okay, or plaque. Yes? Yeah, that's after treatment with the herb, right. No, after you drink the herb, it will come out through urine. And you put it there for a days, you know, it's going to come out. How long does about one week. I see that one week. Sometimes you're going to see it next day. Depends how much you have, okay? Look, keep looking at it. Some of them is very white in color. The one white in color tells you you have a lot of calcification in the blood vessel. So some of them actually come from the brain. Now, if you're trying to understand more on the Alzheimer's disease, if you open up the brain of those old people, you will find out the brain is consists of lumps of white stuff. They call it beta amyloid. It's a form of protein, actually, that with a lot of calcium in it. So those are stuff that block off all the blood vessel to prevent supply to the brain. That's why they lose memory and all that function, because those things become a damaging part of it. So for people who have brain disease, you'll see a lot of white stuff come out like this. The uh, yellowish stuff is uh, cholesterol, where the other one with white is with calcification as well. Some are very white. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Well, we'll have a Q&A question uh, session very soon, okay? You have a microphone, so I can hear better. Okay, so all that cholesterol you see here and uh, really scare you, and this is what happened inside your body. Consider you're 60 years old, and for 60 years you've been drinking all this uh, nice soup, you know, a shark's fin soup and all kind of uh, thing, and it, it, it really accumulates inside a blood vessel, okay? Now, as time goes on, the blood vessel become narrower and then become hardened, and that's where the problem comes up. You know, the, in the hyper pressure and all these things because of that. So one of the basic, I think, uh, uh, way I try to make a person heal or treat all kind of diseases, is the first thing is to get rid of these blockages in the blood vessel as well as the problem in the head. So after the brain restored to more, you know, functions, the body will respond and you know get better as well. Okay, that should conclude my seminar today, and I'm a little behind. And, uh, but I'd like to start the Q&A session right now. So I will have a mic. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, those who have questions, could you please come up to here and we'll give you the mic. You can line up over here. That's a great seminar and uh, just a few questions. Since sure. you're, uh, you're obviously in Hong Kong, so the patient has to uh, go to your Hong Kong office for treatment, is that right? That's well, first of all, let me clarify one thing. The reason I make, I mean, I, I organize this seminar is not for asking you to come to Hong Kong. I try to give the message that I researched for seven years. They are nice work, okay? Some of the results I have taken, I'm able to bring up to such a high level as far as the medic, uh, medical work in Chinese medicine. I want to share with you. Okay, I'm not saying I'm asking you to come to Hong Kong. So let's understand that first. But if you really want my service, I'll be happy to. But I have to be in Hong Kong. Okay. Yeah. Now, when do you expect to receive a uh, Nobel Prize in medicine? Since Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought I heard it wrong, so I'll only repeat it one more time. When do you expect to receive Nobel Prize? Okay, I, I, I heard you, but I asked you one more time. I just want to make sure I heard the right thing. I tell you, if I really want a Nobel Prize, even 10 or 20 is not enough for me. Because I can challenge the world for all kinds of diseases that cannot treat, I can treat them. Can you believe me? Right now, I have a patient's father in here that I treated the two and two months daughters on the respirator machine that don't know what the next day will be. He's here, but I don't want to say his name. He's willing, he will say, if not, it's okay. But I can do that. There are a whole bunch of Stanford doctors, specialists, are not able to do a thing. In fact, they recommend to pull the pup, and I'm able to do it. It's less than 10 minutes time, and the herb follows that. She is now breathing like a normal person. It starts moving the arm and leg now. So I think if you talk about that, I think I deserve a lot. 
But that's not what I'm looking for. My looking for, I'm able to put my work to this point that I can people accept my theory and to study more and hopefully to bring the Chinese medicine to a much higher level, to such a level that we really surpass the Western medicine because they are a single board computer. We are a full network computer. <laughs> Yes. Uh, credible in the, and uh, professional uh, medical uh, journal. You know what? When you are in a group of people, let's say a thousand people, they are all idiots. And then you be, is a genius. You know what that genius is? That genius is become idiot. <laughs> so I don't want to be that. Not at this point. It will take a long time for people to recognize my work, like Einstein. Einstein take a lot of time for people to recognize his genius. Before that, he's a crazy person. So I don't want to become an idiot when I'm facing with a bunch of people that don't understand what I'm talking about. This is now the beginning of my work. After seven years of research, that is the intention, is to publish my work, to let the whole world know about, so that they can follow my footsteps and further on study my work and work together and then you know, to show the world how powerful that can be. Autism is one of the toughest disease now in the world. And I take on that one because I know I can do so much on that. So that's why I want the world to understand how much Chinese medicine can do. I'm not asking for my reputation or my achievement. That's not my goal. My goal is to bring up the Chinese medicine to let the world understand for the past few thousand years of our work, is not foolish, it's not scientific, it's very scientific. So scientific that we still don't understand 100% what they said. I'm only really working on the tip of the iceberg right now, okay? And I'm able to perform on that. Now, let's say 10,000 Chinese uh, uh, med medical doctors can perform one thing. If one can do it, that one, if you can spread the word around, then the whole world can do it. If, if provided that theory can be accepted, be able to further study and really work on it. And I'm trying to be that person to start the fire. Thank you. So, uh, very question. Uh, can uh, be your medical power treatment affordable to regular middle class people or this person or family with this autism uh, uh, problem has to be uh, very high profile, uh, rich in the world? Okay. Um, so I'm not trying to cut you short, but we are limited with time, so I know what you're trying to ask. Uh, sometimes my mind will be a little faster than you, so I'm sorry that they'll try to cut you short, okay? Uh, actually, if you talk about the cost, it's very costly. If you're trying to think about what I just said earlier, I said each prescription actually consists of over 200, around 200 species. Think about if you only buy one dollar per species of herb, that also goes through grinding and all these processing, okay? Let's say $1 per species. You're talking about $200 per prescription, okay? So that's very expensive. And my goal in Hong Kong is to achieve academically as far as medicine is concerned, not to make money. But that costs a lot. But costs a lot is not my problem at this point. The post is in the future, there are a lot of funds right from you know, Bill Gates and all these funds, you know, all these charitable uh, foundations, they can donate money for that. But my work is to concentrate on the academic level, to medicine field, to make sure it can be cured. And then we talk about how to cut down the course and do it later on, right? So I hope you understand that at this point, cost is not my main concern. But although it costs a lot. I think she has a high function in uh, this uh, in, uh, ASD. And uh, we live here, and both my husband and I are here. And then how do we go to Hong Kong? Oh, that part is simple. You simply go my, uh, actually, we can talk about that later if that's okay. Uh, it, my minimum requirement for any uh, autistic children to be treated had to be in Hong Kong for one month. For me to understand him you know, very thoroughly, 
that the body function, what is deficiency he is in, what kind of problem he had. And based on those criteria, I'm going to do it one by one to make sure he improve on each and every area. So I need to really put effort into it, okay? And see his improvement in a weekly basis. Okay, so if you can do that, then we can start and then later on we can send her across to here when you come back to this country. But you have to come to Hong Kong for the first month for me to have really, you know, close contact with him so to understand him, his body functions, okay? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my question is regarding to a specific issue. Uh, my mother has been exercising Qigong a long time, and uh, eventually he, uh, she got uh, like a Zhou Huo Ru Mo. Uh, what's that again? Zhou Huo Ru Mo. Oh, Zhou Huo Ru Mo. Yeah. Mm, Zhou Huo Ru Mo. Every day, every day okay. if, if she stand up and uh, some qi, just to pull her uh, down, and make her very, very uncomfortable. And then she tried to find some help from either Western or Ch the Chinese uh, uh, doctor and the Yung Qigong master. Uh, they always say, oh, this is uh, Ru Mo because of Qigong, but uh, nobody can uh, uh, cure such problem. So my question is, according to your theory, uh, what uh, uh, can you explain um, this problem and uh, what are we supposed uh, to treat from which point? Well, first of all, let me tell you, I'm not an expert in Qigong. <laughs> so I really can answer some of the detailed problems. Although I do have a lot of qi in my body, I use my qi a lot to help patients. And I see amazing results with that. But I do not practice it. So if you say you you have to find a really uh, master in that area to help her. But uh, if you come down to medicine, I can help her too. But that probably is not in the qigong area. Uh, in the medicine area then, okay? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for your time. Actually, I come here by accident. My husband referred me to a newspaper. I'm like, okay, I'll just drop in. But after I, I stay in, I plan to be like in five minutes, but I can't go. I decided to stay until the end. Um, I really appreciate the knowledge and you know all the ex uh, experience that you showed to us. And I want to make a comment by saying that um, Although you think that the Chinese medicine is kind of uh, still kind of not in the um, majority, um, uh, getting majority of the recognition, but actually I think all the Chinese people, um, they, we have some knowledge. And as a matter of fact, my grandparents who was in the med, uh, Chinese herb kind of area. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but although right now I, my knowledge on herbs is zero, but I, in my blood I really believe in that. And um, I think oh, if you really, um, I think the experiment is really amazing, and um, if you want to get some help, or we can really do something and do something, I don't know how much we can help, but I think that maybe we recognize that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very um, much. So uh, with that being said, I actually have two questions. I, sh I saw all the amazing results, but uh, my son actually kind of in the minor um, side. Um, I don't know whether um, your your medication can cover kind of I, I can't well, so yeah. Again, I don't want to cut you short, but I know what you want to ask. So uh, basically, for spectrum, uh, so autism, autism spectrum disorder, there are wide range. Some are very minor, some are serious. Okay. For the minor one, of course, you take less time. Okay. So for this kind of problem, you talk about, you know, you go in circle right. all the time, right? Now, this, to me, from my experience, it takes about three weeks to three months and can be taken care of. And it's uh, still a symptom of the, uh, what do you call it, the aut autism uh, uh, spectrum disorder. Now what happens is there's some blockage in the brain that have a route. So it keeps going through that route. So the signal, whenever it starts, it goes through that routine. So I have to break that route. I have to clear that blockage. Then it will be okay. So, so okay. in your treatment, have you seen any regrets? I know there are a lot of amazing results, but do you see any symptoms, like, especially for my kids here? Well, see, in order to do that, I really have to look at him. There are a lot more things I can tell that you cannot. Right. Because through my observation, I can tell a lot of things, okay? But then it takes treatment. Uh, then, you know, I mean, if you think... Now, there's no such thing as called a minor autism or a serious... Yes, it makes a lot of difference in behavior and the look and everything. But I'll tell you one thing, which I want to tell you. Even though... How old is he now? He's nine and a half years old. Huh? Nine years old? Nine and a half. Nine and a half. Nine and a half, okay? All right, so 
even though he only have minor problem, I have seen two patients uh, going back to Hong Kong this time after the uh, last uh, seminar, and they told me the boy, both of them, relatively normal. There's some problem in speech, but after they get to 10 years old, it suddenly deteriorate to such a point that they cannot say a word and, and, and become very funny as far as overall body function, like the one that you know, close his hand, kind of want to, don't want to see people, things like that. So in other words, when they get to a certain age, those problem areas start developing. And normally, you have no problem, that would be better, right? But when you're hitting a certain area that have a defect in there, and that become a problem, it suddenly, it really go into a big problem. That is two cases I have that really scare me. So although you have no problem, and now suddenly when you grow older, they become worse. Right, that's actually coming to the next question, which, which is my last one, I promise. Um, so uh, actually, my son has been improved. Um, that's why I'm kind of curious, shall I really take him to, to the doctor to take some you know, medical treatment, or I should just pray because I'm also... Um, now, uh, did you try the Western way? The Western method, uh, actually, like uh, controlling diet and things like that? Actually, um, I took him to... Uh, he was actually diagnosed as ADD, and uh, I actually put him on kind of medication on Concerta. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. But it, it showed amazing results. It just me and my husband took concern. If you have some good result with it, stay with it, because you don't have to go to Hong Kong for that, okay? <laughs> so I think just stay with it. But one thing is, you have to understand, what do they do? Did they take, now like I said, if you believe my theory, the problem creating this problem is the blood clot and the toxin in the brain. That's the key point I'm trying to say to you guys, right? If you cannot do that, no matter what you do, it's going to be temporary. It's going to be like symptomatic relief. That's not what you want. You want a cure. I'm talking about how to cure this problem. So if I take those toxins out, take those clot, blood clot out, he can restore a healthy person and then stay that way. So is that possible that I can like, like, have a chance to see him? And if you say that he has a chance, then I'll take him for his job. If you decide and actually have the intent or intention to come to Hong Kong, I'll be glad to see him before you make that decision. Okay, that'll be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, and very nice talk, and amazing research, actually. And the one suggestion is uh, maybe and you want to think about so going into the academic and uh, to supervise some graduate students, or maybe study along with your research. And so in that case, you will have more results in the short time. You will benefit both societies. And uh, another question, actually, I just want to ask uh, is that when you're doing this kind of amazing and uh, you really high stakes, right? And uh, how do you know actually that's come from the brain, that's come from the heart, and that's come from the liver? Yeah. And that's based on the statistics? It took me seven years to find that out. <laughs> right. So you just based on the statistics? It's not by chance. It's people not by dreaming. It's by facts. Yeah. People have brain problems, then you based on the observe their blood you know, by using sampling technique and through all these years' effort by watching urine, and I am a very, um, I would say, very imaginative and very uh, uh, a creative person. And with that, I can do a lot of things that a lot of people don't, cannot do. So through my observation alone, and they come up with all these decisions, yeah, for all these uh, results, yeah. Okay. Another thing, actually, I want to for sure is when you do the testing cell, you collect the urine samples. In the beginning, you take pictures. And after a while, then you take pictures again, right? And is all the urine samples sealed, completely out of the air, or you're just simply exposed to the air, let it evaporate? No, no, no. We simply have the lid closed very tight, very and tight. then just let it sit there. And there's some air inside the bottle already, so it, okay. will, it will start, you know, it's I mean, oxidation by itself. Right. Actually, I skipped. There's one thing I didn't show you uh, is some of the crystal from the kidney. Uh, I thought, uh, okay, there's a crystal. Try to turn it back on. Let me flash through it. Let you see it, okay? Sure. Now, you're an acid crystal. This is from the kidney, mostly, and from the brain. The toxin that uh, become damaging to the uh, axon, okay? okay? Look at that. These are crystals called tartaric acid crystals. And then uh, clear crystals, and also you see the uh, uh, this one on the, uh, the from the kidney, kidney stone. Okay, yeah. 
And look at all these, different color. Can you see that? Oh, it's not on yet. Oh. And you don't think actually calcium itself, all capture also causing something. What? I'm sorry. Because a lot of the depositions must be positive, right? Yeah. And they relate with calcium. Calcium is some of the byproduct from the bodies. They will calculate. Everything all comes. Something was a, become, all the time become a deficit. It's not so soluble anymore, then it just crisp it out. All the stuff coming out, I'm not saying that I can, I can tell 100% of everything come out, but I can tell the most prominent stuff that came out, okay? Yeah. Which is quite critical, you know, in recognizing which part of the body. Now, this is from kidney. Look at all these kidney stone after being dissolved and recrystallized into crystals. They have different form, they have different color, different shape, all that. After an 80 year old person, after I bring them all out, he become a young man again. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Look at that. The crystals, different shape. All that different shape. <clears throat> I'll just go very quickly on that. Amazing, isn't it? How much I can see on the urine. See, this is the. The clear crystal is the most damaging to the nervous system, the neural systems. So for all the autistic children, they all have that. So at the end, after the, almost close to finishing, you see those things will diminish to a point that you don't see them anymore. Now I have another one, this is a complete urine sample of a five-year-old, the Japanese boy cannot speak. Complete urine sample, let me you know, you see it. Fatty liver, the fats come out even though he's only five years old. So when the hormone become bad, you can see all kind of uh, malfunctioning in the organ. See how much crystal we have on the kidney? And the urine is very dark. I think that's great, and uh, why not just go to this nearby Hong Kong University and collaborate with them, then take some of the samples the LC or other things. You know, technically speaking and theoretically speaking, that's a very nice suggestion. But you come down to the human jealousy, that's not functionable. You understand what I'm saying? Because they are the master, not me. I don't even have a medical degree. You see what I'm talking about? Uh, they would not accept my work. They call me idiot the other way. <laughs> You see my point? I did approach Baptist University, Chinese Medicine. Really? I'm talking to a wall. I treated a master, headmaster, that he had problem, cannot be cured. I cured him. He didn't say a word about my work. Okay? Instead, asked me how to be better. He didn't tell me how to join him and do the work together. I asked for that. I'm asking for assistant professorship. He don't want to do that. That's called human jealousy, okay? Very common. Okay, look at all these uh, samples from one person. Look at all the fats, crystals. And that person able to talk and improve tremendously because I'm able to bring out all these toxins, all these bad stuff from his body. Look at all the crystals, the clear crystals from the brain. And all the toxin from the liver. Amazing, a lot of them. Okay, that's it. Any more questions? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, do you treat patients who are... Turn, turn on light. Are, uh, turn on light. Do you treat patients uh, who are going through dialysis? Do, do you think you are able to treat patients who are going through dialysis? Dialysis, right? Yes. But let me put it this way. I think I can help the kidney to improve its function based on the Western index like creatine and things like that, okay? But the only problem is, when they do that, I ask them to stop all Western medicine. Each patient that comes to see me, the requirement is the same. They have to stop on all Western medicine uh, 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 you know, completely. So that person normally rely on dialysis every day or every other day, uh, and also some of those medicine to go along with it. They will not, and they're not willing to risk. You know what I'm saying? So because of that, normally it's very hard for me to treat. 
Although I think it's a great possibility I can help to, to improve the kidney function. Do you think, is there any danger if you stop treating the uh, like in two or three days? I'm sorry, I can't. Let's say you ask the patient uh, to come, come to you for treatment, yeah. have a really turn, and uh, if they stop the dialysis treatment, will they have any danger? Well, let's put it this way, okay? I mean, that's one thing. Like I said, I'm in research. So it's always some kind of danger of some kind, at the beginning particularly, okay? But now I've gone through all that with my own body. So everyone say that, you know, Chinese medicine is very harmful if you take it all the time. I have been taking it for four years now. Every day, two times a day. What do you see? You see a healthy person, don't you? 65 years old, able to talk five hours continuously, and be able to flow like that, okay, like a young man. I dance on the floor three hours a day. That means the Chinese medicine is not harmful, but very helpful, right? But is that everyone think that way? No. It's hard for me to change the people's thinking. You know, if the world thinks the white is black, then you have to say it's black. That is what I'm facing right now. You see my, my problem? But I'm willing to do these uh, seminars for all the people in the Bay Area because I've been working here for over 30 years and I really like to benefit you all if you think my work is beneficial, at least to a little bit of it, that'd be good. Because that's the way I return to society. I do this seminar without charging you anything because I come out from an AEC company, okay, sponsor all that. Uh, according to you, that means uh, people who are uh, the, the dialysis, it can be cured. Let's talk about autism right now because we are limited in time. So, so at some other time you can call me, you have my phone number, right? So we'll talk about that later on. Let's concentrate on autism that's, uh, right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a mother of uh, our beautiful big son, and he's almost six. And I used to be an engineer, so in your field, so <laughs> I really buy into your theory and model. And um, I have a few questions. My son, he's, uh, we are on a, we have almost done everything. There's a lot of improvement. And he's on what they call a, um, of the NDF, so it's called Rogovici Genetics, and, and he's on a lot of supplements. And, and some of the things we did according to genetics, I think it was really helpful. So do you really require to stop everything? Yes. No exception. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So for how long? Um, as long as your, your son is treated by me, you have to stop. Because I want to show you my work. How I can do, how much I can do. If you mix it with that, oh, I just use that also, so I mean, then what kind of, uh, who is doing the job for you? Mm -hmm. See, I'm doing research. I want the effort to be 100%, you know, whether it's bad or good, my work. Besides, there are a lot of reaction with the chemical or the actually Western type medicine can mix with the Chinese herb and can come out with very bad effect. That is unpredictable. Let me ask you a question. Some people, they use, uh, they believe in Western medicine, right? They have high blood pressure, they are diabetic, and they have a liver infection, or they have whatever. You know what they do in the Western medicine? They look at you, oh, you're a diabetic? Give you a diabetic pill. Oh, you're high blood pressure? Give you a high blood pressure pill. Okay, you have cholesterol problem? Give you a Lipitor, okay? Uh, then you have uh, infection, antibiotic, right? Do you know all these pills that gave you, when they mix together, what is the outcome or the final side effect? Do you know who, what it is? No one knows except yourself. So these are kind of problems. Even they have not perfected to that point. And now you're talking about mixing with Chinese medicine? Who is going to take responsibility when something comes out bad? It is not a medical, uh, Western medicine is some herbs that support the body, some of those, like a pantry support, and uh, it's some herbs. So do you also require any time I treat anyone, the basic requirement I need is to stop all Western medicine. No exception. Even though a terminal cancer patient, I have treated many of those. Okay. okay. Um, my second question is, uh, we have been watching his urines and uh, this, the protocol we are uh, following, he, uh, are also very interesting urine. And how serious a metal spine to, uh, why is spine to uh, metal that's very hard for the metal equipment to support the body, right? And uh, first, uh, you get a high creatinine in your urine, and then after the creatinine go down, and the heavy metal starting to flow. 
So um, um, you know, I look at your, the the urine in your sample. It seems to always the first two sample, the first two week sample is always like a much darker urine. I mean, before the oxidase, and so have to. You know why? <coughs> because I change the prescription every week. Every time you change prescription, the power becomes stronger at the beginning and then become you know, weaker because the same route is cleansing. Like you have 10 rooms that need to be cleaned. If you keep cleaning the same room all the time, you only have one room clean. You gotta clean all of them, right? So every week I change prescription to go to different route, be able to go to the whole body eventually. That's why you see darker, you know, you go into a different route and pick up those blood clot, okay? That's why I need people to see me every week, okay, to change prescription. So uh, they are also uh, talking, and I do see that on myself and with other moms, that when the kids are support correct, and that sometimes the first few days, and they regress before they progress. Do you see this? Yeah, you're right. Uh, actually, there's one thing I forgot. Actually, I didn't have time to go on to that. I have a name for that. It's called pseudo-fever syndrome, which they call yeast die-off syndrome and Herzheimer syndrome. So it happened that the research I did is very consistent with some of the work they did, you know? What happened is when they get rid of all the toxin and at one time you're gonna have a pseudo fever syndrome. I use the word pseudo, it's not a true fever. It's a similar to a fever syndrome, okay? And what happened is they have a higher temperature in the body and also they have vomiting feeling, sometimes even vomit, and also have muscle pain. All they come along with it, but then after that, normally it lasts a day to two days, and it's not a fever, and it will surpass, actually it will become, it will jump into the next level, you suddenly see a better improvement, I mean a step jump improvement, and I call this pseudo fever syndrome, but in the process, it seems a little bit uncomfortable. Okay, um, uh, another question is that, I know that you have, you say you have a lot of uh, herbs and mix of herbs of 2000, and 200. And 200, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, do you write it down so that we as a parent know what you're giving to them? I can tell you one thing. Go into the book of Li Shizhen, Ban Chao Gang Mu. You look at them, you're going to see a lot of herbs I use from there. <laughs> it's all traditional Chinese medicine that are being written and have documentation on. It's not something I found from the Tibet or something. It's not that. Okay. Hi, I just want to thank you very much for your research and all your hard work. Um, I, I wanted to know, because I don't think the bottom line for those of us with an autistic child is whether the answers come from the East or from the West, it's just that an answer is found. And I'm wondering, are you collaborating with um, organizations here like the Autism Research Institute that is open to different let me tell you this, every time I have a seminar holding in the, in the San Jose, I, we always email all these organizations about our seminar, right? All of them. But we don't see any results. We don't see any response from them. I don't know why. I want to tell them my work, yeah. but they don't seem to be interesting at all. Um, have you specifically contacted the Autism Did, Research Institute? Look, let me put it this way. If you email or try to tell them I have a seminar by using Chinese medicine right. uh, to those organizations, if any of those people are interested what I'm doing, I'm saying that with very promising results. Right. That's why I say, and they don't even want to look at it. They accept incurable as a result rather than some, he must be an idiot, that guy, right? That's why I said to you earlier. Okay. So it's not that I don't want to. I want to very much, but they're not responding to my request. Okay. And then my other question for you is, uh, there are people, um, organizations in this country that, that are talking about things that so, supposedly are uh, creating recoveries. Um, and there are organizations that are saying that it is in fact, uh, these children can be cured. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and I've been dealing with this for 18 years, um, there are no <coughs> cures. There are methods, there are things to look at. Because you have not seen one that cured, because you have not seen my work yet. Okay. See, if people like, you know, what you're saying, that the group are really interested, if I am in, you know, really in that group, I will come to, give me a call. 
Hey, what you have been doing? Can you show me some improvement of those child? Can you show me that cannot talk before can talk now? Things like that. Have you tried to do that? We actually talking uh, a person from San Jose Mercury had contact us after seeing our ad. I don't know how to see it. And it was I, paper. I saw your ad. You call me. No, oh no. Okay. Yeah. You see what I'm trying to say? I tried to call her. She never wanted to respond to me. So I, this is what I'm talking about. I'm trying to break this message to the public. I want them to know it can be cured to a certain degree, depending on how long you want to treat them, right? It takes time. But when I say treatable, means whenever I cure the person, that let's say the hyperactivity, when it slows down and everything, I mean cured. It won't happen again. See, diet control only for while you're under control, you're able to hold them down. But if you don't control the diet, it will come back again. See, when I did, take this blood clot out, he become quiet again. I mean, quiet for a long time. Mm -hmm. You see? I want to tell the world, I want to tell those people. Yeah. See, I, I think that that's what I'm really hearing from you. Is that it's you probably very get that. That your message goes out. I presume because you are not a supposed MD, that's where you're getting. Yeah, your what she did is to ask me what kind of title, what kind of credential I have. Right. See, that right away tells me he's one of those so-called, uh, you know. But perhaps a way to, uh, to network better is to not approach the organizations, approach the parents' groups. Because the parents, in my opinion, are the ones that will listen to anybody. You know, I mean, they will listen to anybody. They are willing to let open up their minds to come and listen. Let me your interrupt you no. before I say any further. There are 14 families came to see me after the seminar, the last one in June, from the Hong Kong. The whole family came, the father, mother, sometimes the sister or the whole family, you know, come to see me. For they, they stayed there for four weeks. I asked for that as a minimum requirement. On each and every one of children improved to a point I think is remarkable. And yet the parents say, it doesn't seem to be that fast. Is that remarkable? But you don't understand. I, when I said about treatment of these cases, I require at least one year. Mm -hmm. But they forgot about that at least one year. They will look at the three weeks result. If that three weeks result is just some improvement, that is a lot. Mm -hmm. It's only three weeks. But they don't understand that. So end up, I only have three families right now that come to continue to see me continue the treatment. Those are really remarkable changes. Okay, but some of them is not that remarkable in a way in the ordinary parents because they see them every day. Yeah. But for me, when I see them once a week, I can see the improvement very easily. Like the last name, can I say, you know, in 17 years, I can make him say it in one week? Things like that. But they don't think it's that important. They thought I have a magic that make him talk right. Uh -huh. They just thought that way. They look at me with a look of the eye, you know, feeling that I have some magic, you know. Well, you know, this is the U.S. we want. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, people are very greedy. They don't understand. It's Thank a very, you very oh, much okay. For all your yeah. Homework. Okay. Hi, uh, I have a six-year-old. Um, it's so hard for him uh, to make him take the pills or uh, any um, supplements. Or, so I'm wondering, is your um, herbal medication in a capsule form or liquids? Um, okay. <gasps> Actually, I don't want to scare you. The herb prescription comprises about at least 200 species. They're in a powder form. They're about five pounds. And you're going to boil them from 40 bowls of water down to two bowls. You know how long it takes? It takes about four to five hours to get it prepared. OK, you're going to do it two times each prescription. And normally, for the money you pay for every week or every six days, it, um, three, there are three prescriptions, three bags, which is total about 15 pounds. You know how much energy I'm putting in that herb there? So it's a lot of effort. Unless you have a child that's so much problem, you probably don't want to do that. Unless you're to a point that you cannot get cured or any kind of disease, you don't want to do that. But I'm only treating those that are, have no hope. So people think it's OK. Because when there's no hope, there's hope there, they'll do it. So you require the family to be there for a month. So do you see the cow every day, or? No, you see, uh, normally patients require to see me once every six days. Six days. Once every six days, yeah. And after that, you just No, after that, until it's cured, you know? I mean, sometimes, like I said, the patient would meet the two, the twins, the twin sister. 
is five years almost with me. And t recently, I asked them to stop for a little while because I think uh, they're so tired of the herb now. But they're to such a point, almost, I would say they're 90% cured. 90% cured. Okay, very healthy and tall. You know, really muscle and everything and, and swim, um, butterfly swim and everything and compete in the, in the class. You won't believe they were a dying person five years ago. They you know, go in and out of the hospital all the time. They had heart surgery when they were one year old in Brooklyn a Hospital in New York. And they, when they're born, twins are three and a half pounds each. So they have, you know, all these problems start you know, when they come to this world. And after surgery, they have severe headache, migraine headache, and all the other complexities like uh, flus, you know, I mean, all the time, and digestion problem. And it, it just seems like they're not able to make it in five years old. I now make them a healthy person. You look at the picture, you see how healthy they are. So if you say you have a patient that's like 70 or 80% cure? And uh, for five years almost, five yes. Years. Okay. I'd say more than 80% cure. Okay. But it's so, it's so normal by looking at them, you don't even recognize they have a problem at all. I know the, uh, I mean, uh, for autistic children, the biggest deficit is, um, I know they have a lot of symptoms, um, but they have biggest deficit is they have social and language. So. Um, do you see your patients um, be able to social, you know? Yes. Yeah. On each and every one patient that I dealt with, after treatment for some time, they become very sociable with their peers. Do they have any other interventions? They have what? Any other interventions, like any other treatments? Um, what do you mean, other intervention? I don't understand. Uh, You're talking about the applied yeah. behavioral type of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I tell you, people, like I said, those are few, uh, after they come back from uh, Hong Kong, and uh, those three that actually come to see me uh, continuously have reported the teacher have making a remarkable comment on the children. So it's not from my words, from the teachers. They haven't seen them for two months. <coughs> yes, right. I just have one quick question. Um, you talked about autism being a wide spectrum of disorders. Yes. Um, I was wondering if Tourette's syndrome falls under that category. What syndrome? Tourette's syndrome. Brad, you mean Brad's syndrome? Tourette. Tourette, I don't know about that. It's an involuntary, involuntary movement of the body. Oh, it's that, I see, about. twitching, like twitching, right? Right. Oh, but that is part of the syndrome. In my right. category, yeah, I fall right into it. So that, so you... It's like grinding the teeth at night time. And things like that is involuntary, okay? okay. Or like uh, you put a hand like this and right. involuntary. Yes. That's so that's, in your theory, also cause a blood clot. I, I talk about it in link. I talk about that in link. Right. So, so that is it. Okay, so that, yeah. that's considered. It can be cured. Can be. can be cured, yes. Okay. Hi, I think I was here last time in June at the Chinese seminar. I oh, you're yeah, in, the, yeah. in San Francisco, my right? San Francisco, my, my daughter. Oh, yeah, 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 I remember. And actually, I already made an appointment in Hong Kong to see you in November. Okay. But this one question I think I mentioned before that she is taking Prozac. She is taking 80 milligram Prozac. Yeah. So you're saying that even we want to stop all Western medicines? The easiest way to treat this kind of mental patient is use Prozac and this kind of mental yeah. drug. And then you make him so dumb that you don't do anything. But that's not a cure, that's a suppression of the problem. When I talk about cure, I mean bring back the normal life of the person. If you don't stop that, how can I help her? Or help her? I don't know. So there's no other choice. You have to stop that. Because actually, even stopping Prozac take a month to do that. It take about a couple months before you can even she stop that. She's taking it now because she is taking 80 milligrams. So it's so I need to talk to her. Psychiatrist. I have a lot of patients come to see me have been taking a lot of Prozac before. That after take other stuff that they are able they are able to progress quite well. No. Actually, with the herb, actually, it really take the place of that. Besides, actually, it make you make them very happy again. You know, I mean, the, so after the net was clear, you know. So she should she stop taking it? Right Only now? when. Well, actually, if you have to have her to be treated by me, one of the basic requirement I said earlier and repeatedly is to stop all the Western medicine. Actually, I have no sticky for 50, 30 years. Oh, a long time. Okay, I want to thank you. I really think I learned Welcome. a lot. And also, I fear sticky hours a person 
all these years I know him, he never find anything for himself. He loved Chinese culture, loved Chinese people, everything. So I really feel like today, you know, I don't normally actually like my kids, I have a grandchild is has autism. So I really come, you know, here. Normally I won't take time to sit there for that many hours. But I think for Siki, I will go. I told my friends to go because he either don't want to do anything. That's fine. But he wants to do something, he put his heart, his mind. I'm sure today what he said to you know things, I'm sure you know many of us we don't know, some of them don't know what he's talking about. After how many years he studied, he research, how can it be a couple of hours? Now we all understand. It's impossible. I really feel. So I want to thank you very, very much. Here he comes back again, thinking about the Bay Area people, want to benefit us. He's telling me all about us this. Thank but you. But I do have Thank a question you. too, okay? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. The question is about you know, my grandchild. So if I take her to Hong Kong for one month, after one month, do you, then what do I do? Okay. Then and we'll also, I see a lot of Chinese medicine nowadays, they make pills make something to make it easier for other people. I don't know, do you have any no, things like not this? Yet. Or you, do you believe or you don't you believe? See, to be able to cure a lot of hard to cure disease is already a big job. So to work in the pharmaceutical or the herbal, how to make it condensed is another area which I don't have power to do. And they don't have the manpower to do so. So leave it to the government. Eventually, if some people in China or everywhere, anywhere, that really appreciate my work and provide me with uh, all that support, I think I can go much further. But this is one man research. Remember, all the work is one man research. I studied Chinese medicine started in 1970. When my father passed away, I promised him I will continue his work. I will make it into blossom. And I have been treating people since then. So after 30 years of work, then I continue on China, in Hong Kong for my research, which is going to much higher level, all these difficult treat, uh, disease. So, but then you do you do tell us what to do after one month, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Last question is, now, is, after all this time research everything, do you take student? How do you try to carry yes. on? Let me tell you this. Really yeah, let me tell you. That's, let me tell you this. Okay. Uh, Each and oh. No more questions. Thank you. Uh, to answer your question, on each and every patient's treatment, I videotape them from the beginning to the end. I make pictures of on each and every patient, like I did, you see there, and have a full documentation in writings, in addition to the video and the pictures, why it caused the problem, how I treat that, under what theory that fall into, in very detailed description. I have books, I mean, a lot of these records right now that ready for editing and come out with books or teaching material. But at this point, I'm so busy, I just put it aside. One day, when I'm really ready, I will have a group of people to help me to get that into books, okay, and then pass on to the future. That's my goal. I think this is the last question. My question is, today your topic or your presentation mainly encircled around um, autism. And from your bio and your uh, resume, you deal with other topics also, other um, problems, I should say. Um, my interest today actually come is, uh, I like to hear something about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I see that you deal with that. Yes. Are you going to have future presentations? Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, I didn't plan to. I don't plan to. Not because it's not important. Because I feel it's a lot more important to see our youngster have a normal life. It's more needy at this point. And besides that, uh, after having seven years of like, treating people in Hong Kong, I found out that the older person doesn't have the weight as a little kid because if they're in a poor family, they either have no people take care of the, the elder person, or financially, or transportation, all that. Or if they're a very rich person, the children don't care if they're Alzheimer's or not. They'd rather have the signature passed on to them. So don't, don't need to. 
You see what I'm talking about? When you face this kind of problem, it's very sad. But then I'm, that's why my focus is on autistic children, the next generation, to make sure the family can you know, take the problem out of them. For older people, uh, when they get to 80 years old, you know what they say? Well, they already live 80 years. I think it's not bad, you know? So just let them put them in a nursing home, you know? If he's poor, no one's going to pay for, pay, want to pay for that. If he's very rich, okay, you're Alzheimer's, just sit there and let me take care of the business for you. The son wants the business instead, let him do it. So the result is he'll be sit there. See, the problem is that, is that other factors are affecting all that. I have good results in Alzheimer. I can reverse that. I can reverse that. You know, quite a few number of cases I've done, and Parkinson as well. Even late Parkinson. stage? Tell us about it. Depends how late, okay, I can, you know, if it really comes, well, I think I can improve. I have a person that don't know his, her name, don't know her daughter's name, and after about uh, two months treatment, not only she can talk about the names and everything, she can even play my job. <laughs> after two months. And that is, I have documentation on everything I said today, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your attendance. Uh, I think we've run out of time. Sorry to take it to, to the rest of the questions. But uh, my father will be around uh, for the next few minutes. So if anyone has any direct questions. Okay, I just want to make one comment. I just want to make one comment. I think that our, um, I think everybody here too, probably, you know, thank you for your passion for the Chinese tradition medicine. You know, we have it for 3,000 years, and you bring back to the power of using it. You know, to, of course, I mean, I can't say better than uh, Western medicine, but in a way, one way or another, they hope we um, have a you know, good side of it. Um, but I do have a good um, and I'll talk to you person, just a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, do you, if anyone has any other questions to ask, whether it's treatment or any other questions, we can fill those outside. We just need to vacate this place. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Uh, okay. Home run. Home run. Okay. Thank you. Okay.